All right, looks like we are live. So welcome everybody to the second day of these Quantum Many Body Days. Uh, it's good to see everybody here, some uh, known names some faces and, and some new people that, uh, well, new to me anyway. Uh, it's good to see uh, everybody. Uh, I want to say a few words before we get started with uh, the first presentation by Roger Malko. Um, uh, as you can see here, I'm sharing the webpage of our Quantum Anybody Days, and, and uh, presumably most of you have uh, accessed this uh, website at, at some point uh, already, and you see here the full schedule. But uh, beyond this, I wanted to share with you that this uh, is intended as a bridge program to the um, International Conference on Recent Progress in Many Body Theories. This conference was supposed to happen this year, but of course, uh, for um, uh, reasons that everybody knows, it was uh, postponed to next year. Well, hopefully, we'll be able to make it happen here in Chapel Hill. And uh, and within the context of that conference, I want to mention two awards that are very important. One is the fin Finberg Memorial Medal. You can read about it here. And um, and also the Cumul Early Achievement Award. Uh, and you can read about it here. And there's more information on all of this on the wiki of the conference series which uh, is hosted by Indiana University here. So going back to our site and going back to the Quantum Anybody Days, I would like then to go on to introduce our first speaker today, uh, that is uh, Roger Malko, who will be telling us about reconstructing quantum states with generated models. So uh, Roger, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, I will then proceed to introduce you. Okay. Got it. Thank you. So I, I uh, as a way of introducing uh, the speaker, then I want to say a few words. Uh, Roger got his PhD at the University of California at Santa Barbara in 2005. He was uh, then a Wigner Fellow at Oak Ridge National Lab, not too far from here, from Chapel Hill. Uh, and, and, and soon after that, he joined the faculty at the University of Waterloo in 2007, where he is now. Uh, not physically now, but where he is now as uh, <laughs> as a professor. Uh, he uh, is also an affiliate of the Institute for Quantum Computing at that university and also an associate faculty at the Permitter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Uh, he has received multiple honors. I will just mention a few. Uh, the Early Researcher Award uh, from the Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation, the Young Scientist Prize in Computational Physics from the International Union of Pure and Applied uh, Physics, and uh, he holds the Canada Research Chair in Computational Many Body Physics, Natural Sciences and Engineering. And he is a recipient of the Hertzberg Medal from the Canadian Association of Physics. Like I said, we're very happy to have you and, uh, 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 and we're very much looking forward to your talk. So without further ado, please take it away. Amazing. Thanks, Joaquin. Thanks uh, for the great introduction. And it's a, a pleasure to be here for Quantum Anybody Days. Um, I will, uh, I just like to point out, I think before I start, you know, all the amazing people that, um, you know, make this research possible, uh, both at the University of Waterloo and at Perimeter Institute's, what we call quantum intelligence lab, which is a, a sort of, a, a loose, uh, affiliation of students and postdocs who, who are physicists typically working in condensed matter, uh, quantum information, but interested in machine learning. Uh, so I'll highlight a few names, I think, as I, uh, you know, as I talk uh, today. And I would also want to point out some of the collaborations uh, that we have with uh, sort of our friends at other institutes. Uh, most uh, predominantly, uh, Juan Carasquilla, pictured here, who is a faculty at Vector Institute. I'll talk about some of his work uh, with uh, post, uh, some of our postdocs and students. And also Giacomo Torlai, who's... Um, picture here eating pizza at the Flatiron Institute. Uh, so a lot of what we do um, in this work is in collaboration with these other institutes. So I'm going to talk about reconstructing quantum states with generative models. And um, as Joaquin mentioned, I'm a, I'm a computational condensed matter theorist, or at least that was uh, hopefully uh, obvious from the introduction. And so what I'm interested in is quantum many body simulation. Okay, let me know if it didn't uh, uh, progress to the next slide, but I think it did. So I'm using quantum simulation or you know, quantum simulation of many body systems in two different contexts. And uh, the kind of purpose of this talk today 
I think it's to just, you know, get us thinking about uh, these kind of different settings uh, for, for simulation. And the one I'm most familiar with, I've pictured on the left. And very simply, I'm sort of calling it Hamiltonian driven or Hamiltonian driven quantum simulation. And by simulation there, I really mean, you know, what we're, what we're maybe more, most familiar with as perhaps condensed matter theorists, uh, which is, you know, you know, using numerical methods, uh, using computational hardware to simulate either this, you know, equilibrium properties, the dynamical properties, maybe the low energy excitations or the topological, you know, invariance of some sort of quantum, let's call it matter or material. Uh, so, you know, just as a way of illustration, I have pictured a single crystal of lithium homium fluoride, which some collaborators at our, uh, of ours at University of Waterloo study in experimental laboratories, and sort of the prototypical model, if you will, or the Hamiltonian, which we believe describes the behavior of lithium homium fluoride is a transverse field Ising model, right? So uh, my, my job as a condensed matter theorist uh, performing quantum simulation may be to uh, you know, uh, uncover the ground state properties, uh, you know, governed or the ground state governed by that Hamiltonian, uh, maybe the ex energy excitations, the spectrum, and, you know, perhaps the full dynamical properties if I'm lucky, right? And, and the, the idea is that we, you know, we want to do that on a computer because it's difficult to do analytically. The other setting, which we'll hear for quantum simulation, particularly, the, particularly these days, is what I'm now calling a data-driven setting, uh, where I'm I've prepared or an experimentalist has prepared a highly controlled quantum device, and that device, uh, you know, gives us access uh, to data. And I've pictured some data here, which I'll talk extensively about on Rydberg atom arrays, and that data can be used uh, to, you know, uh, you know, to reconstruct the behavior uh, of the experiment. Uh, or, you know, to, to basically, you know, in, in itself can have some sort of value. So that's, you know, when we talk about quantum simulation, uh, that is, you know, happening through experiments, quantum computers and other highly controlled devices, uh, like uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum or NISC devices, uh, that's the second setting. And so even though I work predominantly on the first setting, I only have really one slide to discuss the Hamiltonian driven setting. And, and it's because uh, number one, uh, you know, I'm honored to share the stage with Frank Verstrade, who will talk a bit about uh, Hamiltonian driven simulation in the uh, using tensor networks. Uh, yeah, but number two, I want, really wanted to focus on sort of the machine learning aspect of quantum simulation. So the only thing I really wanted to draw our attention to on the Hamiltonian driven side or the conventional computational, uh, you know, uh, simulation side. Uh, is the fact that we have a number of highly successful techniques for, you know, yeah, in silico simulation of quantum many body systems. Uh, and these have been under development for decades. So uh, I mentioned te tensor networks and I, uh, you know, myself work quite extensively in quantum Monte Carlo and also variational methods like uh, variational Monte Carlo. Uh, all of these have uh, are techniques which have strengths and weaknesses and are under development by a large community of, of condensed matter and quantum information theorists. Um, so the strengths and weaknesses of these different techniques are in many senses complementary. And, you know, we have a number of physical principles, I believe, uh, which tell us, you know, which simulation technique uh, will be most powerful for a given, um, you know, I would say Hamiltonian to, for, for solving the properties of a given Hamiltonian, for example, in the case of tensor networks, which we'll hear about next, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the method is based on an onsots essentially uh, that, uh, you know, revolves around low entanglement or area law like entanglement, which is sub, you know, sub maximal in many senses. And what this does is uh, give us kind of a, uh, I'd say a physical um, uh, bedrock or a physical cornerstone uh, for the development of tensor network methods. In quantum Monte Carlo, of course, we have the sign problem or the absence of a sign problem. Uh, so I will talk more about how sign problems affect both data-driven and Hamiltonian-driven simulation. Uh, you know, so how the sign structure uh, um, of a Hamiltonian or a wave function uh, affects these methods. And one thing which, you uh, one aspect, or I'd say one sort of physical or mathematical aspect, uh, which we, I think we often overlook, which is very important for variational methods, is the concept of optimization 
other of uh, you know parameters like variational parameters or ergodicity in sampling, perhaps not parameters of a model, but configurations of say the ground state wave function or something like that. So these are three recurring themes, which I'll actually come back to uh, when I talk about the data-driven setting. And so in this talk, I really wanna ask the question, how do these experimental simulators or these emulators, which we've presumably constructed, you know, uh, to, um, you know, study systems which are difficult by conventional methods, how do they compete with or complement our existing numerical methods? So for example, uh, take given the case of say the Hubbard model or a frustrated spin model, which has the sign problem, uh, you know, which perhaps is on a two or three dimensional crystal lattice, which is too, um, I'd say big for uh, tensor network methods or DMRG in particular, you know, we may be motivated to build a quantum simulator uh, which which you know which encapsulates that Hamiltonian experimentally. And so once we have that built, or once a laboratory has that built, what do we do with it? How does it complement these techniques and how does it compete with these techniques? So to introduce the data-driven setting, I would um, I just want to give a kind of very simple sort of picture of uh, the interaction of a quantum device, you know, a highly controlled quantum simulator or a quantum computer, and kind of a conventional computer. Uh, that we're using to, you know, to number one, design it. A lot of what we do, I believe, is, uh, you know, currently is helping design experiments, control experiments. Okay, so control and the control of a quantum computer is sort of a very, I'd say, rich uh, field of you know, physics and engineering, which has a lot of overlap with what, what we're talking about. And also, of course, the readout, uh, you know, the state of the device. And, you know, the, I'm going to focus on uh, this latter um, task, which is reading out uh, data from this device. And I want uh, to kind of, you know, just for concreteness sake, to imagine that I have a quantum computer or a quantum simulator uh, that is producing projective measurements. So just very simple projective qubit measurements uh, uh, distributed according to the uh, Born rule. So that data set that I'm dealing with in this data driven setting. Uh, is a number of vectors, you know, and each vector is a projective, you know, in the simplest case is a projective measurement of a qubit, which is either landing in, you know, the one or zero state, okay? And re by repeatedly preparing this device or preparing this, the wave function or the, the state of this device and performing a projective measurement, you know, each one of those measurements gives me one complete vector of data and you know, I might have some limited number D of these of this data. And at this point, I'm going to start making analogies to tasks in machine learning. Uh, so really, what each uh, you know for the machine learning aficionados, I want you to think of each one of these data vectors as an image. Could be an image of a cat or a dog or you know whatever it is. Each one of these zeros or ones is a pixel in that image. And my goal, uh, you know, given this data is to learn what we call a parameterized quote unquote model of the quantum state underlying that data. So in the machine learning context, you would be interested in learning the distribution, for example, a probability distribution that underlies all pictures of cats or all pictures of dogs on the internet. Here, what we're doing is learning a model which, uh, you know, number one, uh, you know, parameterizes these pro uh, these probability distributions, these born distributions, but you know, I think more powerfully uh, uh, will parameterize the entire wave function. <clears throat> and I'm saying parameterize for a reason. I'm going to talk a lot about the parameters that are involved in uh, what we call these these generative models. So in the data driven setting, so again, I'm assuming most of us are familiar with you know, you know, a model Hamiltonian that we want to solve for either the you know equilibrium or dynamical properties of. In the data-driven setting, we don't a priori have a Hamiltonian. And so we might ask, how do we train a model? You know, we might be more used to the variational setting uh, where we, you know, we calculate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian given a trial wave function. And we know that there's a variational bound, but we don't have access to the Hamiltonian. So what we do in the data-driven setting when we wanna train a model is to adjust the parameters or tune the parameters of the model to minimize the difference between the distribution that we're getting from our model, and I'll talk about what these are, and the physical target distribution, which is these born distributed 
you know, projective measurement distributions. And that can be done through uh, an object that's related to like the, you know, relative entropy of these two distributions, uh, the callback Leibler divergence. So P of X here in red might be the distribution that underlies the quantum simulator or the quantum computer that's been, you know, prepared in a certain state. And, you know, P lambda, uh, lambda uh, defines my um, uh, parameters, weights and biases of a neural network or whatever, which I'll talk about. And so the callback leibler divergence basically returns zero when these two distributions completely overlap, right? And it's greater than zero if there's any sort of discrepancy like I've shown here. So that's it. That's all we need. We need to have a parameterized model, which gives us you know, the likelihood or gives us the probability uh, parameterized in these weights and biases, lambda. And we need access to data, which is these X vectors, um, uh, you know, from the previous slide. So, you know, with a little bit of manipulation, you'll see that this is equivalent to maximizing this, this problem of, of uh, minimizing the KL divergence is equivalent to maximizing something like a log likelihood. Where I've written this in terms of an expectation value uh, of log P lambda, which is a parameterized model distribution you know, taken with respect to data X drawn from P. So that's the data drawn from your quantum computer. And then all we have to do is in this maximization procedure is find, you know, the, you know, the extrema in this, in this landscape. So this defines our optimization problem. And we use something like stochastic gradient descent, you know, define the minimum or the maximum uh, in terms of these parameters, Lambda. And so this update step Lambda goes to Lambda prime uh, is often a simple kind of SGD uh, type of procedure borrowed from machine learning. Why do we do this? I mean, the first question you should be asking is, you know, why do we bother, you know, learning the parameters of a model if we have access to data that's drawn from the distribution? And the very simple explanation, just to nip this in a bud, uh, which is relevant for the experiments that I'm going to show uh, is really, you know, the, the data that we have access to is limited and it's in some cases severely limited by the experimental shot budget. So when I show you data for Rydberg atoms, uh, you know, we can only get data at the uh, frequency of something like three to maybe 10 shots per second. Um, and so these are very, you know, big, uh, elaborate experiments and that's a significant kind of cost for data. So what generative models do is, you know, in a very simple sense, try to smooth out, uh, you know, any of the irregularities in the data caused, uh, you know, by this low, by any low sampling rate. And, 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 you know, that the goal is to generalize the data not seen in the training set. So what I mean is illustrated in these two plots here. So on the left is, you know, fairly complete sample of a distribution. Uh, I'll let, you know, leave the form of the distribution to your imagination, but you can see that with something like 10 to a hundred, uh, samples. I can't remember how many I produced here. You get a nice representation of, of sort of the distribution, you know, just from the frequency histogram, which is all that I've, I've plotted here. If, however, I was only able to sample a few hundred uh, uh, elements of, you know, a few hundred vectors, a few hundred elements of this uh, distribution, uh, I might get a much more choppy sort of uh, uh, histogram, which, which, you know, wouldn't it be great to, uh, in, in terms of inference or like, uh, uh, calculating likelihoods and which we may want to generalize and the generalize you know generalization means drawing from a bin that essentially hasn't hasn't been seen so either something far out in the tails or something here where i have some sort of sparsity of data and what a generative model does is sort of the idea of the red uh, line so that red line is actually of course a gaussian that's fit with two parameters and in that case, because we have some sort of, you know, bias, we have some sort of assumptions on the form of the distribution. These two parameters are enough to give us a real accurate uh, sort of uh, model of that data. But what I'm talking about are model in the next slides are, are going to be models with many, many more parameters. OK, uh, instead of just two. And the task is going to be to adjust all of these parameters, which could occur in some kind of neural network. Uh, sort of systematically to get a good interpolation or a good smoothing uh, of the distribution. And we see um, examples of this type of procedure all the time in machine learning. So I'm just showing elements of a, of a, a data set called Vox Celeb 2, uh, where a, a generative model, so one of these highly parameterized uh, models, uh, has been trained and then has been uh, you know, fed data uh, a limited data set in the, in the 
uh, form of these pictures. And of course there's pixels and this is some sort of, you know, single shot that's, that's came from an experiment, which is a camera. And, and on the left-hand side is the raw data set. On the right-hand side are generated images. Okay. So these are generalized, you know, generated images uh, that don't occur in the data set because, uh, you know, on one hand, you can imagine there's many pictures of, of Marilyn Monroe on, out there on the internet, but we, of course, don't have a complete sampling of all the possible states that she took, you know, uh, that her face basically took uh, over, over her lifetime. And what this generative model does is take a very limited data set, and because it's pre-trained on some other images, uh, basically, you know, generates these uh, images which have never been seen before. Okay, so that's kind of the underlying idea behind generative modeling is that, you know, given some limited data set, uh, we can produce uh, images or, or, you know, vectors X from a distribution which, which aren't contained uh, in that set. So what I showed you are images produced by a generative model uh, that falls kind of uh, on one branch of this, I guess, taxonomy or this organizational structure for generative models, which I think is kind of relatively useful. So at the top of the tree here is maximum likelihood methods. And I talked about maximum likelihood being related to kobach leibler divergence. So in some sense, very much at the heart of data-driven um, you know, simulation. Uh, now I have two branches, one's implicit and one's explicit uh, density. And implicit density means essentially that your parameterization uh, you know, isn't explicitly representing uh, a probability distribution, or in our case, a quantum wave function. And GANs are famous uh, implicit density generative models. So the images that I just showed in the previous slide were generated by a GAN, okay? And without getting into a GAN very much, uh, you know, really you have some sort of training set, uh, which you've, which you have, in this case, uh, is looks like it's MNIST. It's it's these handwritten digits, but could be pictures of Albert Einstein or, you know, projective measurements from a quantum computer. Um, you have a generator structure, okay, and this generator structure is tuned to produce uh, a fake image or a generated image. You know, just given the input of some random noise. But importantly, sort of inside this generator, there's no explicit representation of the distribution that you're looking at. Um, really all you're doing is using it to produce an image, which is then fed into another, uh, neural network, a discriminator, which, which, you know, triggers, uh, the output of, you know, whether it's, it believes it's real or fake. Okay. And this is used to train fed back into the generator and used to train it. So these are implicit density, uh, very powerful models. Uh, but I guess my argument, uh, against using implicit density models, um, is, is I think for what you, you know, for the applications you'll see, uh, we don't have a lot of control on things like, you know, amplitude versus phase or purity of, of quantum states and so on. And, you know, for that sense, um, I'll show results exclusively for explicit density models. So explicit density models, I broken down into two different subcategories. One's approximate and one's tractable density. So explicit density means I have an explicit representation of the underlying probability distribution. And the most famous example for us physicists are these restricted Bolson machines. RBMs or earlier these uh, Hopfield networks uh, are essentially Ising models. And by the way, John Hopfield, uh, famous condensed matter uh, physicist. So, you know, the field was really started on the machine learning side, uh, you know, by some of the same, I would say, audience uh, as, as we're hoping to reach with this seminar series. So, you know, physicists have already contributed quite a bit to the to um, uh, the, the field of machine learning. So an RBM is just an Ising model, and I've just parameterized sort of a distribution, uh, you, you know, using an Ising Hamiltonian here uh, in, in, in kind of an unfamiliar form. Uh, but W, I, J are just, you know, call them J, I, Js, if you will. They're just the interactions between two different nodes on this graph. And I've labeled the variables on these nodes uh, V and H for visible and hidden. And you know they are they take Ising values zero or one. So this type of Gibbs or Boltzmann distribution is really just the you know the explicit density of this model. Um, two things to note: number one, it's an approximate density model because we don't have access to the partition function. Okay, so it's unnormalized. Number two, it's systematically improvable. So these types of you know wave functions or distributions, if you will, have a representational capacity. 
which is going to be important for us. And we can systematically improve it by increasing the number of hidden units. So the number of visible units corresponds to how many qubits in your device. And the number of hidden units can be, uh, you know, can be uh, made larger or smaller, depending on how much, you know, say entanglement or how much, uh, how many correlations you have to uh, represent. Although I'm not going to touch on it too much, the tractable density branch is probably the most exciting branch of this tree. And it includes uh, most of the natural language processing models, such as RNNs and the, you know, the, the more famous transformers like GPT-3. Uh, and, and basically anything that falls under the category of autoregressive models. Um, so, you know, very simply, tractable density models give a, you know, a normalized, if you will, probability distribution as an output. And I've shown an RNN here and, you know, inside, I should have put a Lambda inside of each one of these orange boxes is a bunch of weights and biases and neural networks, which I'm not talking about. Uh, what you input into one of these units is the state of a qubit. So perhaps, you know, you have an N qubit system. Uh, this is the state of qubit three that comes from some measurement. H is a hidden unit or a hidden um, vector, which you pass along. And the output is the conditional distribution of the next qubit state along the chain conditioned on all the previous ones and you know you, you keep repeating this for the how many qubits you have in your device and this is you know through the chain rule of probabilities this is what gives you this auto regressive property this normalized property so it's very important uh, and very powerful uh, in these tractable density models uh, the fact that you have these normalized distributions uh, which allows you to uh, produce perfect samples okay and it's very similar to I'd say DMRG in that sense, um, in the sampling algorithm by, I think it's Andy Ferris and Gifrey Vidal. Um, Frank will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but you have a, a method of producing perfect samples uh, from DMRG, which is in some sense very similar to these autoregressive models. So what I'm not going to talk too much about is how we generalize these standard generative models for quantum wave functions, but you can, you can kind of get an idea um, from these schematic pictures that I've shown. So if I have a probability distribution, a classical distribution, uh, you know, I, it can be represented, you know, essentially by this, you know, um, restricted Boltzmann machine. And, you know, with some caveats, it's kind of a universal, uh, there's like a universality theorem associated with this, which says that any distribution within reason can be um, you know, can be represented with enough resources. So enough hidden units or enough weights and biases. <clears throat> if I want to represent more than just, you know, a probability distribution, I want to have some sort of phase. There's a very simple way of doing this, either by uh, using complex weights, a la Carleo and Troyer, or, uh, you know, using another machine to just represent a parameterization of the phase. And that can be extended from pure states to mixed states. Uh, in some sort of purification scheme to give me a density matrix. So, you know, both, you know, complex uh, pure states and, you know, the density matrix representing mi mixed states uh, can easily be, con be constructed with standard generative models. And, you know, I've shown them with the RBM here, but really, uh, you know, I think essentially any generative model can be modified like this and can also use standard training techniques. And I won't talk about it, but there's also much more sophisticated ways of combining generative models, uh, you know, with things like POVMs or tensor network, uh, you know, representations of POVMs, uh, which have been uh, pioneered by Juan Carasquilla, which really allow for direct estimate of observables without, you know, an explicit reconstruction of the density matrix of the state, like I've shown above. So I just wanted to mention this, um, although I won't, you know, really show too many results. Um, uh, from this. So what I want to do is back up and, you know, now that I hopefully I've convinced you that we can use these methods to represent, you know, wide variety of quantum states, either, uh, you know, pure states or mixed states. I want to go back to the simplest case where I, am, I want to look at the pure state, which results uh, from, uh, you know, uh, you know, which is the ground state of a stochastic Hamiltonian. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is important because it it really kind of whittles down um, a lot of the um, uh, you know I, I think a lot of the extra work involved in, in reconstruction 
of quantum states because it's so simple. So first off, what's a stochastic Hamiltonian? By this, by my definition, which is, you know, I think standard and I believe uh, basis dependent, uh, you know, this Hamiltonian in, in a given computational basis, uh, if it has this type of form where uh, all of the off diagonal matrix elements are negative, uh, then we call that uh, a stochastic Hamiltonian. Okay. So this has a lot of uh, relationship to the sign problem, of course. It essentially is the sign problem. So saying stochastic means that this Hamiltonian has no sign problem, which also means that it can be simulated efficiently by quantum Monte Carlo methods. It is basis dependent. So you can have a basis, you know, you could have chosen a basis that's non stochastic, uh, like in the case of, I don't know, you know, the Heisenberg model on the square lattice, two dimensional square lattice, but there may be a very simple unitary transformation, which brings you into a stochastic basis. Uh, and so we, we, we often, we often say that, you know, these problems, uh, these Hamiltonians that can be easily transformed to the stochastic form have no sign problem. For my uh, for my purposes in this talk, uh, I'm going to use a slightly different uh, consequence, and that's through the parent Frobenius theorem, which basically says that if you have a Hamiltonian in this form, the extramal eigenvalues are all real and positive. So what it means is that if I have if I believe that I'm preparing uh, you know, a, a, this a state of a quantum device that's governed by a stochastic Hamiltonian, then I can assume that the data that I draw from that device, you know, um, it comes from a wave function where all coefficients are positive and real. And so the, the you know, the, the wave function is then just really square root of the probability distribution. And that means if I want to model that wave function, I'm completely safe in just, you know, model, number one, uh, just modeling the amplitude, okay, like I did with the restricted Bolson machine uh, on the previous slide. Um, and also, uh, you know, the, the, big, the single basis, the computational basis in which I'm stochastic is informationally complete which means I don't need to, you know, draw samples from uh, an exponential number of bases. I can perform this reconstruction with one basis. So that, you know, fortunate state of affairs uh, is what occurs uh, in this Hamiltonian, which describes some real experiments that I'm going to um, um, discuss now. So this is the Rydberg blockade Hamiltonian. Uh, so, you know, so uh, basically been under consideration uh, in particular by Misha Lukin and others, uh, you know, for 20 years and uh, had a had a interesting, uh, you know, theoretical set of developments by Paul Fenley and collaborators uh, back in 2004, which showed that this Hamiltonian is a very interesting uh, uh, many body interacting Hamiltonian that can realize uh, uh, a, a large number of interesting phases due to this so-called blockade mechanism. So what is the blockade Hamiltonian? <clears throat> So I've written it in terms of uh, the Rydberg occupation basis. Okay, so a Rydberg atom is just an atom that uh, you know uh, approximates a two-level system, uh, and atoms you know can occur. You know each atom's electron can occur in its uh, the ground state or a highly excited state. So these are something like rubidium atoms. Uh, the ground, uh, sorry, the Rydberg state is something like principal quantum hundred quantum number like a hundred-ish. And, uh, you know, the, the atom takes these two states uh, and a transition is induced by sort of a Rabi frequency, which I've called Omega here, or Rabi drive. Uh, and so, you know, you, this, is, this is the zeros and ones of your data sets, or this is the, uh, you know, the two states of the qubit, if you will. Um, the sigma X operator, so I've written in this poly uh, kind of notation, uh, is the off diagonal operator that's associated with that um, Rabi frequency. Delta is the detuning. So what you what delta does is detune, uh, you know the you know off of uh, sort of resonance, if you will. So it breaks the symmetry between uh, ground state and Rydberg state. And most importantly, Vij is an interaction which occurs between all you know i and j atoms in this Rydberg array. So it's a long range interaction which has this van der Waal form. Uh, and importantly, so it's the case is one over R6, and it can be written in terms of uh, a parameter which we call the river blockade, which is essentially an effective radius outside of which 
you know, you need another atom needs to be in order to not, you know, be interfered with. So that, you know, there's a cost of energy here. If two atoms are both in their highly excited Rydberg state, unless they're outside of this Rydberg blockade radius, this blockade radius. So that's one way of thinking about it. And so what that means is that, you know, you have a long range interaction. The lattice geometry is very crucial and you'll get all sorts of different phases and phase transitions, uh, you know, depending on, you know, the river blockade, the lattice and all of these other parameters. So very interesting Hamiltonian uh, can be prepared in experiment, which I'm going to show. And it's also stochastic under a, a very simple local basis transformation, which flips the sign here. So that's important. Here is some of the most recent theoretical and experimental work uh, out of Harvard and MIT, which studies Rydberg uh, blockage, which I think is, is really fascinating. So here is a theoretical um, uh, you know, phase diagram, um, which has been uh, you know, mapped out with DMRG. Uh, and one thing I want to point out is that you know, this is, ex this is uh, on a square lattice Rydberg system. Uh, of the same size as what can be reached experimentally. Uh, and this second paper here is basically a nature paper on a roughly 16 by 16 array size um, through, uh, from Misha Lukens group at Harvard. So, you know, what's, what's exciting about these experiments is they're now accessing, you know, things which we dreamed about theoretically for decades, such as quantum critical points, in this case between Disordered is all, you know, ground state. Checkerboard is some sort of pi pi order. And, you know, here, without saying too much about it, is the experimental results for the, you know, Rydberg occupation susceptibility, which has taken the numerical derivative of the occupation value as you sweep across uh, this phase transition. Uh, that numerical derivative is fit. Uh, and then you know, the maximum is used to, de de uh, to define the position of the critical uh, detuning. And through some collapse, which I won't talk about, critical exponents are extracted. So this is all experimental. So Sabir Satchev says this is the uh, you know, first instance of a two plus one dimensional quantum critical point in the Ising universality class that has ever been demonstrated experimentally. So you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to get access to these types of uh, experiment and the data they produce. Another interesting set of experiments, which is motivated you know, by these theoretical papers uh, and including Again, the DMRG uh, mapped out phase diagram is the existence of spin liquids. And I'll get back to it, but you know, there's two separate papers, one by Satchdevs uh, and collaborators, one by Vishenoff and collaborators, um, which show evidence for uh, you know, in certain parts of these phase diagrams for different lattices, uh, you know, Z2 type spin liquids uh, using DMRG simulations on sort of fat cylinders. Okay, and there's there's also uh, experiment that has recently come out on 219 atoms that has studied this spin liquid. So quantum critical points, you know, topological phases, you know, this is why we want to build quantum emulators or data-driven quantum simulators experimentally, because in principle, we should be able to access all this sort of interesting condensed matter phenomenon, uh, you know, in these highly controlled uh, devices. And so how do we leverage these devices? I just want to show an example of how uh, we can imagine using this data uh, in a very simple one-dimensional array. So forget kind of the 2D phase, you know, 2D square and frustrated lattices I was showing in the previous slide. Very simply, here's, a, here's some experiments from uh, uh, this paper um, uh, by Misha Lukin uh, and, you know, using some of the work by Manuel Andres uh, for, you know, the optical tweezer setup uh, for these 1D arrays. And each one of these is like my data vector X. So just keep that in mind. And, you know, if I have a, a black dot here, maybe that's a one or a zero. And if everything's in the black dot phase, this is everything's in its ground state. And then as a function of, you know, actually what happens in the experiments is an adiabatic uh, uh, sweep of the detuning. What happens in these experiments is you can sweep along different uh, lines in these phase diagrams, depending on your sort of Rydberg blockade right, that RB parameter, uh, which is tuned by the lattice spacing very simply using the optical twe tweezers. And so I can uh, use this adiabatic sweeping of the detuning to sort of start in everything in the ground state, uh, prepare that, and I can sweep into things like Z2, Z3, Z4 uh, types of ordered lobes um, uh, in, in these experiments. And there's a lot of interesting 
experimental and theoretical work, even in these 1D cases, uh, which has come out recently. So what we did uh, in collaboration with um, uh, Manuel Andres and Misha Lucan, and this was a work spearheaded by Giacomo Torla, who's now at Amazon, uh, and Brian Timar and others, is we basically used the Rydberg array data as a training set for a generative model. And again, here's this adiabatic sweeping as a function of time. You see that your omega and your delta parameters uh, in the experiment uh, you know, are, are sort of modified uh, in order to sweep through different as, uh, different cuts on the phase diagram. So we expect a, a, a phase transition to occur at some point here. What the experimentalists could provide is 3,000 projective measurements per detuning parameter. So remember that these, these um, it depends on the, the dimensionality of the, the array, uh, but this data can be obtained maybe, you know, at, that, at a rate of three vectors per second or maybe up 10 on these these 1d experiments i can't quite remember so they're they're relatively expensive uh to kind of resolve phase diagrams but that's great for generative modeling so we assume that the Ryberg hamiltonian which governs these experiments is stochastic so it means we're assuming purity and positivity of the wave function okay and then uh essentially what we're doing is training a generative model and producing estimators so i'll show how that looks on the next slides Okay, so let me let me just decipher this. So EXP is the experiment. So the black line uh, connects, uh, th this is essentially uh, Rydberg occupation data, and I've just rewritten it as sigma Z for some reason, but it, it's it's like occupation of the ground state. So you have a 100% you know, a, a chance of essentially being in the, the entire array is in the ground state like this uh, for low values or large negative values of, of detuning. Uh, and each one of these black, you know, lines connects a data point. So um, the ED is an exact diagonalization of, of that Hamiltonian. So it's kind of like the Hamiltonian driven simulation of, of, the, ex of the experimental Hamiltonian. And it looks like you have great uh, correspondence between uh, the ED. And again, this is only eight or nine uh, atoms in this chain. So we can do diagonalization. The experiment. And the RBM is the reconstruction from the experimental data, which we did. So again, we assume purity, purity and positivity of the wave function. Uh, we use a restricted Boltzmann machine, very simple, with a certain number of hidden units. Uh, we, you know, we, um, uh, you know, basically say that the wave function of the model is square root of the probability distribution. We train it with conventional methods, stochastic gradient descent, KL divergences, and then any diagonal observable so any anything that's any operator that's diagonal in the Rydberg occupation basis is it's you know very simple uh to take the trained model and to reconstruct the estimator from it okay and so that's exactly what we've done here and these rbm triangles show that you know you get perfect agreement between uh the reconstructed uh you know wave function and the experiment and so maybe no big surprise right <laughs> So I think what's a bit more interesting is the fact that, you know, since, you know, all of these assumptions that of, of positivity and purity uh, and, you know, the fact that there's no, you know, the fact that there's no phase associated with this wave function uh, allows us to do all sorts of tricks, which we've adopted essentially from variational Monte Carlo methods. Uh, so, for example, if I have an off diagonal operator, sigma X, um, uh, yeah, and I want to, you know, understand the expectation value of that operator, you know, typically this isn't something that, uh, you have direct access to, uh, you know, from, from the experiment, because you only have, uh, data that looks like this, which is diagonal in the occupation basis. So what we've shown here is an exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian driven simulation. And then the RBM is a data driven reconstruction of the, of the ground state, uh, wave function. And what we've done is uh, calculated the off diagonal, um, the, the expectation value of the off diagonal operator uh, using this trick of rearranging things uh, to produce the local estimator. So this local estimator is again, some notation used in variational Monte Carlo. So when you have a explicit representation, so an explicit density representation uh, of, the, of, the, of the wave function here, as long as this local estimator is sparse enough, uh, this is something you can, can can easily calculate. 
So what you see is, uh, you know, we have a discrepancy between the Hamiltonian driven expectation and the uh, data driven reconstruction of this estimator. And I think what's kind of interesting about uh, this case is, is exactly this discrepancy. You know, this is something we get to feedback into the, uh, you know, experimental design. And, and, you know, and it illustrates that even though you can have, you know, some estimators behaving uh, very well, uh, it's worth it to look at some of these other estimators, especially these off the angle ones, which can indicate experimental issues. So in this case, I think this was corrected by the final uh, version of this paper. Um, and there was some detuning offset essentially here. Okay. And, you know, <clears throat> something to do with control software timing, which again, I don't really know anything about. Uh, but this was, you know, I think a valuable illustration of how uh, this type of reconstruction can be used to help uh, influence uh, uh, and understand experiments. And then, you know, you get into interesting questions about, you know, whether or not you trust the model, right? Whether your sort of like data-driven learning procedure uh, is, 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 you know, getting stuck or whether it's training uh, properly and so on. But I'll address those maybe a bit more at the end. Just another nice example of what this type of uh, method can do uh, is illustrated here uh, in the second Rennie entropy. So again, this is a, you know, this is an experiment where you only have access to, uh, you know, these fluorescent images of the atoms, um, you know, either the, in the ground state or the Rydberg state, uh, you know, the second, uh, you know, the entanglement entropies aren't something that we typically uh, imagine getting from uh, data like this, but, you know, what can be done very simply uh, once we have one of these generative models is uh, sort of the swap operator trick uh, which I've written out in Penrose notation here, but <clears throat> you can read about in, in, in one of our papers, uh, which gives us access to the second Rennie entropy, which is a measure of the entanglement entropy that's completely basis independent. Uh, so here's a second Rennie entropy as a function of detuning for different bipartitions of a eight atom system. And again, you can see discrepancies between uh, the, the, the experimental reconstruction, which is the diamonds and the triangles, and you know the expectation from Hamiltonian driven simulation. So again, this is something that uh, yeah. we're at we're at uh, almost ten till. If we could wrap it up in just a few minutes to leave time for questions. That would Perfect. Be yeah. Oh, I think this is my last my last point. Yep. Perfect. So so this uh, so all I wanted to say was entanglement entropy. Uh, you know, it's also something that we can reconstruct uh, essentially directly from this experimental data. And it kind of leaves us at this interesting point with these simulators, which I've illustrated here, which, you know, if you read a lot of these Rydberg atom papers, of course, the phase diagram has been mapped out with uh, DMRG on fat cylinders. Um, this suggests parameters in the experiment. So I'm looking at some of these spin liquid experiments. Here's a Kegame lattice. Um, and, you know, once we, once we, or the experimentalists sort of stabilize, uh, you know, a region on the phase diagram that they find interesting, you know, they want to confirm whether or not a spin liquid exists there, for example. Uh, and so there's all sorts of measurements that can be taken experimentally in this occupation basis. What I'm sort of suggesting here is that, you know, all the experimentalists really have to do is produce clean projective measurements of the qubit states. And then this hasn't been done yet, really, um, except for that previous illustration. But then we can use this projective measurements these projective measurements to reconstruct a wave function or a density matrix or whatever you want. Uh, and then, you know, from that, you know, which is essentially as good as a variational wave function that's been trained, uh, you know, with knowledge of the Hamiltonian, this is a, this is a, you know, a onsatz wave function trained with data. We can do any measurements that are accessible to, um, uh, you know, these methods that I mentioned. So in particular, things like the topological entanglement entropy and so on. So I think it's kind of interesting to see the interplay or to imagine the interplay between conventional Hamiltonian driven simulation, experiment and reconstruction uh, in these, and specifically in these uh, Rydberg spin liquids. Uh, but, you know, I think also in, in other um, uh, sort of quantum, experimental quantum simulators. So with that, let me just skip to um, my discussion points. So the point I wanted to get across, standard generative models can be easily, you know, borrowed from machine learning, either in, in you know, image 
you know, computer vision, let's call it, or natural language processing can easily be adapted to reconstruct quantum states from data. Uh, and then what I didn't really talk too much about is, is reconstructing states that uh, come from Hamiltonians that aren't stochastic or from dynamical pro uh, processes, but this is also something that can be very easily done. <laughs> There's a new generation of variational wave function motivated by these models. Okay, I talked about the data-driven setting, um, and I alluded to the fact that these wave functions have uh, can be systematically improved by increasing the number of weights and biases. So when when Frank gives his talk, if you talk if we talk about the bond dimension, which you can systematically increase in order to improve the representational capacity, these variational wave functions can also be systematically improved with more weights and biases. Uh, you may remember uh, Giuseppe Carleo and Matthias Troyer's paper in 2017, which introduced this concept of variational simulations with neural networks. Today, I think there's many really exciting architectures related to autoregressive models, recurrent neural networks, and transformers. Um, and I've illustrated a two-dimensional RNN here, which is under development by uh, Moh Mohamed Hibet Allah and Juan Karaskia at Vector Institute, which I think is a very promising variational wave function. And again, the nice thing about these variational or these neural network onsets is that they can be used for Hamiltonian and data-driven simulation. So we're really just entering the, the, the phase, uh, you know, where, you know, experiments with clean projective measurements, again, uh, you know, can produce data that can be used to, to train one of these onsets wave functions. And in the case where you have very limited data, we can imagine doing additional training steps with a variational method. So you can imagine some sort of hybrid training of these uh, wave functions where, you know, it's partially driven by experimental data, you know, partially driven by something like a variational uh, update. And I think this kind of hybrid method, you know, number one, I think it's very interesting to pursue in the future. Um, number two, I think it raises a lot of questions of, you know, what, you know, what we mean when we talk about reconstructing experiments and sort of how much maybe modeling we're comfortable with uh, when we when we talk about these experimental wave functions. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much, and I can take some questions. Great, thank you very much for this very nice talk. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat. Um. I have a very short question. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, Roger, you were talking about experimental wave functions. When you go to like many Rydberg atoms, uh, it may be difficult to reach ground states or states close to ground states. So can your analysis tell that you are far from ground states, for example? Okay, so could my analysis tell me whether the experiment has achieved uh, its goal of, of preparing a ground state or not. That's right, yeah. I'd say that's a very kind of condensed matter. I think the answer to that question is a very condensed matter question in some sense. Um, so number one, you would, I, I believe it would, you know, it would help to look at uh, discrepancies from what we, from expected ground state behavior. And, you know, we certainly could imagine um, reconstructing, you know, other excited states uh, if we're given that data. Uh, so I think number one, the answer is be answer is like, you know, you're comparing perhaps, uh, you know, different models for the behavior, um, which I think in the era of quantum supremacy or quantum advantage, when these computers get bigger than what we can simulate. Uh, I think then it'll be an issue because we're going to ask, you know, what, what do we compare to? Another, um, another point is that you may be able to uh, essentially reconstruct wave functions or, or, or density matrices that have additional parameters that include either like a purification or something like the phase, and then look at the values of those weights. So try to interpret uh, you know, the neural network to see if there's elements leaking in that aren't part of the ground state. But, you know, that I think that there's a lot of unknowns there because basically what you're asking for is an interpretable method. And any of us that work on machine learning know that interpreting what's going on in the architectures is always, uh, always a challenge. So I don't have a great answer. Sorry, Baskaran. Thank you. 
Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. All right. Uh, Dean, go ahead. So, so Roger, that was a great talk. Uh, thanks so much. I learned a lot from that. Um, my question is, if you have a situation where the you know that the Monte Carlo simulation has a severe sign problem because of, of intrinsic frustration, there's no pairing channels, for example, in a fermionic system, then do you expect the same problem to occur in a restricted Boltzmann machine that you would have difficulty reproducing uh, the, the phenomenon? Yeah, it's a super great question. Um, first off, if, if I go back to this slide, I could ask that same question about a variational Monte Carlo simulation, which has no sign problem, really, and like a you know a quantum Monte Carlo simulation. So, you know, if I have a sign structure which gives me maybe a exponentially exploding uh, variance on an estimator, like in a Hubbard model, um, okay, so that's you know the the source of that's sort of obvious. But if I if I have a variational method which I'm trying to optimize parameters of, and and you know the the, the question is you know is that will that work and if it doesn't work if i don't get a good ground say why mm -hmm. and so i think there's a lot of discussion about you know the roughness of this landscape that you're optimizing in that sense and you know whether or not say if you have frustration that 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 turns uh, that gives you a glassy landscape or, or you know if you have a sign problem where that gives you glassiness in the landscape so those same questions apply here so if i have a restricted Boltzmann machine i'm really kind of on the right hand side and i'm optimizing it you know, not variationally, but with data, but I could certainly have a challenge in that optimization step if that landscape isn't well behaved. And, and for me, it's very hard to know how that connects to things like a sign problem. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dean. Sure. Great. I think we have time for one more quick question. Uh, Manu, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. I have a very simple question. So in this one, uh, can you just calculate the density matrix or you can also calculate some of the coefficient of the wave function? So I think what you asked is whether I can calculate a density matrix. So yeah, here are two examples of where uh, we've parameterized density matrices. Uh, so here's an explicit parameterization of a density matrix using these techniques I've talked about. So yes, you can, you can certainly, um, you know, calculate, if you will, uh, or represent the, uh, a pure state wave function. Uh, but, you know, a mixed state is also possible. And uh, you have a choice between an explicit parameterization, which gives you access, uh, you know, to all the coefficients, if you will, if you want to think about it like that. But we also have, um, you know, machine learning motivated, I would say, models of density matrices, which aren't explicit. So in that case, you know, if, if I think of a non-explicit representation of a wave function, you may not have direct access to the amplitudes, um, but you can still do things like maybe calculate some limited amount of estimators or so on. So the analogy, I think, is the same for the density matrix. You can have a very powerful implicit representation, uh, which might not give you, you know, directly the form of the density matrix, but can give you any sort of estimator that you want to calculate from it within reason. So I think that's my answer. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You. Perfect. All right. Um, with that, thank you again, Roger, for this very informative talk. Um, thank you very much. I will go ahead and turn this over to the next session. So thank you. So I am supposed to introduce uh, Frank Verstreiter, right? I'm just coming right now from teaching. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, my name is Gerardo Ortiz uh, from Indiana University. And, you know, it's always a pleasure to introduce Frank. I mean, indeed, Frank, uh, it's an outstanding, I mean, he's a very good friend, an outstanding guy. But in particular, he is the first recipient of the Herman Kummel uh, Early Achievement Award. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, this is very special for, for several reasons. I mean, one of the reasons is that this was one of the few of the few occasions that Herman Kummler was present, okay, there, okay. Um, uh, second is that, you know, I mean, uh, indeed, uh, Frank has set such a high standard, okay, of excellence for this award uh, 
that now every year is more and more difficult, okay, to select the right guy, okay? I mean, fortunately, in the future awards, we were, I mean, uh, we were fortunate to get outstanding candidates. Uh, indeed, that tradition will continue, certainly. So, um, you know, Frank is uh, originally from Belgium, and he did a postdoctoral a PhD work at, the, at Leuven, the university, the Catholic University of Leuven. And later on, he moved as a postdoctoral uh, fellow to the group of Ignacio Sirac, uh, where he continued doing uh, magnific work. And uh, after a few years, uh, he moved uh, to uh, Caltech, uh, the, uh, 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 more specifically to um, essentially the Institute for Quantum Information that, uh, you know, John Preskill is the head of that institute. And uh, almost a, a few years after, I mean, it was just one or two years, I mean, uh, the impact of his work was such that he got a full permanent position, a full professor position at the University of Vienna. Okay. Um, uh, 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 that was in recognition, you know, to the type or high level of work that he was uh, doing in the, uh, in the context of quantum information and I would say condensed matter physics. Uh, in 2012, he moved back to Belgium, where he is currently leading a huge research group in the University of Ghent. Uh, and uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the kind of work that Frank uh, uh, does. I mean, he does, you know, very original work, but in particular, he works uh, on developing techniques uh, uh, and methods uh, that are, you know, that had some sort of quantum information theory uh, flavor, and uh, he adapts those technologies essentially to study a, a, a classically uh, simulations of a strongly interacting problems, NPR problems. Okay, so that is one of his main strengths, and he had been, you know, played leading roles in development of several of these techniques. Uh, he has, you know, advanced uh, variational techniques such as, uh, you know, PEPs. I mean, PEPs was uh, one of the first generalizations of uh, the matrix product states to higher dimensions. And later on, he generalized these things to tensor networks in many different flavors. And this is what I think he's going to talk about today. So with this, I mean, uh, I pass uh, uh, the microphone to Frank. So thank you very much, Frank, for being with us. Thanks a lot, Gerardo. I think you were way too nice. And I'm always suspicious when people are so nice to me, it feels like they need something. I have bad things to say about you. I have bad things to say about you. No, you were, you were Particular... really exaggerating a lot. Uh, yeah. But let me try to uh, share my screen. Okay. In particular about soccer, I have very bad things to say about you. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, Anyway, it's um, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to 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 be here and a great honor. I uh, I still remember indeed this uh, this uh, this Kumla Award. This was like uh, the, the, the first time that I uh, that, that was that, that was actually a, a, a big thing and, and and one of the reasons, of course, that I got kind of uh, this position in Vienna and all this. So so I'm very uh, I'm very happy and glad that that I had the honor to do this. Um, so today I will um, talk. Um, about about a continuation basically of the work that I did uh, uh, a long time ago that started indeed with Ignacio Siak and then, and then with John Preskill and then, uh, and then after that. So I started uh, very ambitiously with, I, I, I thought I will make a great talk and um, I spent all the time in making my, 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 my front slide basically. I wanted to have kind of a nice picture of of what is actually what 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 is it that that, that tensor networks do? What is it? Is there like a, a simple way of, of conveying this to, uh, um, uh, to 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 to, uh, to 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 the general public? I say to, to my mother and uh, and and of course I I I wanted to have a picture of something like like a spin liquid, something very chaotic. Uh, this is Jackson Pollock, so it's kind of a beautiful, huge, huge painting. It's it's like it it, it, it really symbolizes a spin liquid, and it's very, very complicated to see. And what a tensor network does is actually take out this complexity and make some kind of harmonic, uh, um, uh, one-dimensional structure out of this. So this is in 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 many ways the the, the essence of tensor networks is is trying to to find order and harmony and 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 actually something like 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 entanglement spectra in in very complicated. Uh, superpositions of uh, of spin liquids, and of course, so what I took here is a is the most one of the most famous music 
Uh, and pieces of music. This is the art of the fugue of Bach. So, so it, it it has lots of reputation, lots of structure. This is basically what tensor networks aim to do. Kind of 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 out of the chaos and the or the, the complete disorder of, of of very complicated, strongly correlated quantum many body systems. Try to uh, um, to to relate them to some lower dimensional system uh, in which there is much more order and which where we can actually do the the, 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 the physics. Okay. So anyway, so the outline of my talk, I will. Uh, I will first. I will. I will basically talk about some recent developments that uh, that we have been doing uh, in in my group, both on the on the computational aspects and the theoretical aspects. But of course, these theoretical aspects will then again also touch on to the computational aspects. Um, um, but but in, in general, what these tensor networks do is is we, we try to unravel the entanglement patterns in strongly correlated quantum systems. Okay, this might sound a little bit uh, uh, pretentious, but I, I I will try to to to, to make sense out of this. Uh, maybe. So. Um, uh, what I will not talk about is actually very exciting recent uh, developments in the field of tensor networks that uh, I have personally not been really involved. But, but like, like there's this notion of, of tensor trains, which is basically tensor networks, matrix product states that are used a lot in uh, in applied mathematics. Things like like how do you solve high dimensional differential equations, Laplacians, and things like that. How do you actually use tensor networks uh, uh, for describing uh, uh, things that people in, in the quantum gravity community are interested in, the holography, all these things. This seems, seems that actually these tensor networks provide extremely nice toy models for understanding some deep uh, some some deep truths truths in this in this in this field. Uh, also, like how do you simulate noisy quantum computers? So the, the state of the art methods for doing this. There were lots of very exciting results about this in the last years, and in trying to kind of optimize and coming up with better and better ways of contracting tensor networks that actually correspond to the quantum circuits that people have in these noisy quantum computers. That also. Uh, um, um, Roger was, was was talking a little bit about, and also like like indeed connections between tensor networks and uh, uh, and and these neural network states uh, that Roger was talking about. There's there's lots of of inter interesting interplays between this, but uh, I will not talk about this. I just wanted to mention that there's lots of 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 of, of, of wanted to give you kind of an overview of of some very exciting developments uh, in this field. But anyway, what uh, do tensor networks do? So they um, they basically provide uh, the, the syntax of a language with, with a vocabulary consisting of qubits and tangled pitch. So, so what, what I have here is something that you probably all kind of recognize. It says the resonating valence bond state of, uh, uh, of Anderson and collaborators. And, and so basically what you have is a superposition of all possible kind of, 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 of singlets in, 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 in this spin liquid. And uh, um, the, the, the way somehow we, we want to represent all the, the, the power of tensor networks is that actually this, the superposition of all these possible uh, representations of all these possible configurations can be, can be captured by a very simple tensor. Okay, so basically you take the superposition of, of the singlet being here plus there and so further. This all looks like a very complicated way. That looks very complicated to write down such a superposition uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a tensor network. Well, it turns out that tensor networks are somehow uh, uh, devised, and this is particularly the PEPs, somehow can, can, can capture that with, 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 with something with very low bond dimension. So these, these wave functions have they're not to have very low entanglement, very small amounts of entanglement. And this seems to be a general feature of all these kind of ground states of strongly correlated systems. That is, there's very, very few entanglement in these systems. And this entanglement can uh, perfectly be captured by looking at this from the point of view of, of, these, of these superpositions of, of, of singlets, of projected, of entangled pairs. And, 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 and taking superpositions of this is actually a very easy kind of thing to do uh, using these tensor networks. Okay, so, uh, so basically, what these tensor networks do is they take, they look at the problem. They, you, you have, for example, a spin chain, a one-dimensional system, or you have a two-dimensional system, or you have something like a holographic system. And depending on uh, what what structure you have, what the geometry is of your of your of your quantum many body system, you you use an ansatz that is very well tailored to where capturing somehow the entanglement structure. So like in 1D, somehow the entanglement is always mostly kind of concentrated around nearest neighbors. So these these names are very, very strongly correlated. The things that are a bit further are less correlated. And that makes that actually the, the, the wave functions that, um, that, that describe ground states of low energy states of strongly correlated systems have, have a very particular entanglement structure that can be completely captured by, re, re, by, 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 by representing them with matrix product states. So, so, these, so, so basically, you have these blue degrees of freedom. So these are like your physical spins. And you have these red degrees of freedom. And these are like, this is the shadow world. So this is the, the the, 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 the world, so this is like an extra ancillary kind of Hilbert space in which your entanglement degrees of freedom live. And as you will see, basically what this, 
A mod stew is this exactly this holographic mapping in which you kind of go from a one-dimensional, a full big one-dimensional system with an exponentially large Hilbert space. What these matrix product states do is map this to some local virtual shadow world that is actually very low dimensional. And the same happens in this kind of 2D cases. This is a perhaps here. Uh, that, uh, okay, so, um, so what is this a shadow world? Um, I don't know how to kind of put okay. this there. Okay, so 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 the the, the whole idea is that um, um, that 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 ground states um, or or low energy states of strongly correlated systems can uh, have a representation a lower dimensional representation. So you map basically a ground state problem of an n dimensional system to an n minus one dimensional non equilibrium problem. Okay, so so so. The example, actually, the, the most physical example is something that is, is the continuum version of a matrix product state. It's called a continuous matrix product state. Um, what this actually describes is, um, so the, the, the techniques to describe such continuous matrix product states, they're not to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with the way in which you represent kind of atoms or describe atoms that are living in a cavity. So basically what you have is you have a cavity in which somehow there's some dynamics. There is kind of degrees of freedom leaking out of that cavity. And if you kind of describe the wave function that comes out of this cavity, all these degrees of freedom are entangled because they interacted all with the same degrees of freedom in the cavity. And the dimension of the degrees of freedom in this cavity is exactly this bond dimension that uh, Roger Malko was also kind of alluding to uh, briefly. So you have some kind of non-trivial dynamics going in, in the cavity that, that represents the number of degrees of freedom. And then somehow all these outside, all these qubits, all these degrees of freedom outside are entangled via the same thing. And turns out that the mathematics of describing such a system like the, the wave function of the particles that leak out of this cavity is in one-to-one -one correspondence with these matrix product states. Okay, it's exactly the same mathematics, it's exactly the same physics actually. And this is why we say that actually the this is of course a non-equilibrium system describing a non-equilibrium system in 0D. And the non-equilibrium system, this, 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 this cavity kind of uh, 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 system, uh, has all the features that matrix product states have. And this is exactly what we mean with this holographic principle, the shadow world. Actually, it's much, much easier to describe a non-equilibrium system in 0D than a quantum many-body system in equilibrium in 1D. Okay? Because there's, of course, like you go from something non-equilibrium in, uh, in a very low dimensional space to something equilibrium that is exponentially large. And that's the whole point uh, of, the, of the success of tensor networks is that this is uh, possible. Okay, so what happens actually in uh, uh, in uh, in two D? Well, uh, I of course couldn't. Uh, I had to use my picture uh, again. So this is exactly what is happening also in two D. You map basically a two dimensional quantum spin liquid to a one dimensional effective theory that is non equilibrium. And this theory you can actually simulate now using matrix product states. So there's something like all these these tensor networks that build on to on top of each other. You you kind of simulate a two D system by actually mapping it to a one D non equilibrium system that. On its turn, you can simulate this 1D non-equilibrium system by using matrix product state techniques for which you map it to a zero-dimensional system. Okay? And, uh, uh, and uh, the, whole, the whole point is that, that actually these, all these steps are in some sense understood. And are, it is understood that indeed all these wave functions, all these wave functions on this virtual, on this shadow world can be represented efficiently using all these uh, techniques. And uh, this is also somehow this board gives as we will see, actually rise to, to very powerful numerical algorithms for simulating these strongly correlated systems, but also to some interesting theoretical ideas of how to understand uh, exotic phases of matter, such as systems that exhibit topological quantum order. Okay, so uh, so what is actually the from a numerics point of view? But at the, at the end, this is a, se a session that is supposed to be about about numerics. What are all these? All these algorithms that people have, and there's a whole wide variety of different algorithms for optimizing these. Because at the end, you can understand these that these tensor networks as variational wave functions uh, with respect to well, the, the parameters are basically the local tensors, and you you you, you want to optimize these tensors variationally given somehow a global Hamiltonian. So this is really the Hamiltonian picture that Roger was uh, uh, was talking about. Okay, and so what is actually going on is that. Um, very similar to somehow this neural network, you, you actually work on a manifold. So these tensors, they, they, they parameterize a non-trivial manifold with very nice kind of features. It turns out that these are Kähler manifolds and there's lots of somehow these techniques of differential geometry that, uh, that, 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 that you can use and understand to understand the structure of these manifolds. But, but, but so what you get is actually a very low dimensional manifold in this huge dimensional Hilbert space. Because this is exactly the whole problem of the, of the, of the many body problem is that your Hilbert space increases exponentially with the system size and, and these tensors allow you to map this to a low dimensional variational manifold. 
And what you do is basically project all the physics while well, you would like to evolve the Schrodinger equation. You project that physics onto that manifold. So the only difference is that you start with some state on the manifold, you evolve with your Hamiltonian, and then project somehow this h times psi of a, which is a direction in which you want to move onto the manifold. You just put an extra projector here on that manifold, and then you get basically a differential equation for your tensors on the manifold that stays on the manifold by which you can now do optimization. And actually all the state-of-the-art matrix product state, PEPS algorithms, or even MERA algorithms, they basically work along these lines. That in some sense, this is a way of approximating somehow these kind of differential equations. So get a differential equation, typically differential equations, you get kind of non commutative terms and you have to kind of use splitting equations. Well, all the different ways, whether it's DMRG or NPS or PEPS or, so this is actually all different ways in which you will split and which you will solve at the end this differential uh, equation. Okay, but it provides a very nice kind of, of, of understanding of this and it has actually this time dependent variational principle that, that, that I developed with my, uh, uh, with my student and a postdoc and, uh, and our colleague, Jutel Hagemann, is actually has turned out to be a very kind of powerful way of, of understanding the physics of, 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 this whole, uh, of, of, of this whole framework of how to understand all these, these, these optimization algorithms. Okay, so, so what is still the central challenge? And this is still the central challenge that started actually when we wrote first this paper on projected entangled pair states in, uh, in 2003 and 2004. There's still somehow a very hard and there's still lots of, of progress uh, needed, but there's also lots of progress made in, uh, in optimizing these wave functions, especially in the higher dimensions. So, so, so as you all kind of know, there's still the, the Hubbard model is not solved, okay, but uh, will probably not know what, what does it mean to be solved. I really don't know, but, but of course you want to have a very kind of well-controlled numerical method uh, for dealing uh, with such, uh, such, such, such systems, such as the Hubbard model in 2D. Um, um, but of course, there's many, there's a whole wealth of other kind of systems that you're interested in simulating, uh, um, just like, for example, these Rydberg atoms. And then there's, 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 there's lots of, there's a huge kind of, of, of need, as far as I understand, both in condensed matter, but also in, in, in high energy physics to, 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 to develop methods for simulating ground states or for finding ground states of strongly correlated systems. Um, so what are the state-of-the-art methods for dealing with this? And, and there's still lots of, 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 of possible improvements, but there's also lots of progress made in the last, let's say, three, four years has been made. It's, it's really somehow to, to implement this, this whole boundary ID, this boundary matrix product state methods, uh, and this gradient tangent plane methods to, to optimize these, uh, uh, these, these steps that it has. Turn out that it has been proven that indeed um, um, the, 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 the previous naive kind of methods for optimizing PEPs uh, were certainly not always kind of giving you results that were, from a variational point of view, optimal. So there was this, these things like called the simple update and the full update and all these things. It turns out that these are really not uh, um, these are not good enough for many kind of of the uh, uh, many of the of, of, of the applications that that, that that we have in mind and uh, and these gradient and tangent plane methods that are basically built on top of this of this differential geometric point of view of this TDVP this time dependent variational principle turn out to give you the right kind of systematic way of improving these uh, these algorithms and uh, and using somehow these ideas there's there's many things like excitation spectra on top of the ground state like you, these are of course from from the point of view of experiments very important kind of 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 of, of features you, all of these these can now be very easily kind of extracted. So, for example, this was for some uh, some Ising model in the transfer magnetic field. We also have done it for Ising bed models, and I will kind of show you more results from other people. Okay, so uh, what has been actually a very important development that was uh, that was first realized by Park Sang, Lei Wang, and collaborators is actually that that all these tensor network methods um, um, uh, benefit a lot. Uh, by using differential programming. So, so there is something, this is an idea that comes from machine learning, uh, that, um, but it's actually much older than machine learning, that tells you that whenever you have a cost function that you can calculate efficiently, that actually at the same price, at the same cost, you can also calculate basically the derivative of that kind of cost function with respect to the parameters that you have. And this is an idea that is called basically backwards uh, differentiation, or, or, or this is also called automatic differentiation um, in, 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 in the machine learning community. And it turns out that this is extremely powerful uh, to kind of come up with uh, with, with much more. It's, it, it, it makes it makes programming all these algorithms, these PEPs algorithms, and actually also matrix product state algorithms much much simpler. Okay, so it makes that actually made things that 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 used to be kind of of involve lots and lots of kind of effort in programming like these these gradients, like like we did that actually like 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 uh, uh, Lawrence von Straten did this. It turns out that actually using this differential programming 
uh, ideas from machine learning, uh, um, you, you, you can speed up these algorithms uh, enormously and not just speed up, also the program itself becomes much simpler. To me, this was actually kind of a bit of a shock when I learned about the fact that indeed, whenever you have a cost function that you can calculate efficiently, that you can also calculate the derivative of that cost function at the same cost, basically by making smart use of backwards differentiation techniques. Um, but uh, for example, this is uh, the Heisenberg model uh, that you can do now. You can you can see somehow these these simple update and full update. These are like the usual techniques that PEPs were used up to like a few years ago, after three four years. They really kind of of, of the energy kind of of uh, uh, the relative errors and energy for the same bond dimension are much much larger than you get with all these gradient methods, uh, these gradient techniques that were kind of developed sorry by uh, uh, by Lawrence von Straten, Philip Corbeau, uh, and and uh, Lei Wang and collaborators. And uh, also somehow now you can kind of look at so finally somehow things like the Heisenberg model, of course, for which th there is no there's no sign problem here for which basically quantum Monte Carlo gives you uh, the, the state of the art results. Uh, we can finally kind of, of of match this and do some finite size scaling now with some some, some sorry some entanglement scaling methods. You can actually extract and, and, and get results uh, that are really kind of on par with what Monte Carlo kind of techniques does. So, for example, this is another kind of of of, of instance or another example of of, uh, uh, of 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 recent progress in these steps algorithms. This is really like simulating the Hubbard model. The Hubbard model in two D. Uh, at this in this particular case, it's at half filling, and uh, uh, so that you can actually again compare with quantum Monte Carlo, and you can do this for different values of your kind of, of interaction strength in the Hubbard model, and, and 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 you basically can calculate gaps. You can calculate somehow response functions, and all of these things start to work, and 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 and, and seem to give to make perfect sense and actually give more precise results, certainly for things like uh, like uh, uh, like these dispersion relations and and uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, you you get actually much more precise results as far as I understand than uh, than what you get with uh, with Monte Carlo techniques. And of course, the big advantage of these methods is that you don't get uh, uh, sign problems. Okay, so you really can. Uh, um, um, you can really kind of go to the tech to, to the regime in which somehow quantum Monte Carlo techniques don't uh, don't work. So, uh, so let me kind of talk briefly now, I'll go to the second topic of the computational aspects of tensor networks, uh, namely what happens actually when you want to simulate critical systems, because this is an obvious kind of critique that you could have is that you could say, yeah, uh, uh, all these tensor networks, they are low entanglement kind of methods, but, but why would they still work uh, if you kind of have violations of the area laws? What happens if somehow you kind of look at critical systems? Okay, so, uh, so indeed, the entanglement degrees of freedom in, in critical systems, they are fluctuating much more. So you get, you get things like violations of the area law. But, uh, um, and the question is, can you still capture this? Can you, can you still deal with somehow these issues with these tensor networks? How can you, or is it possible to develop something like a theory of scaling, of entanglement scaling, similar to the finite size scaling methods of Cardi? So, so the genius of, 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 of Cardi was basically to, to understand that indeed, Instead of simulating a critical system, you can just put somehow a critical system on a finite system, such that on a finite grid, such that there is actually a gap. And then study how that gap kind of changes as a function of the system size. And it turns out that this is much more powerful than actually simulating immediately somehow the critical system. So, so, so what you basically do by, by putting it on a finite size uh, system, like, 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 like usual exact diagonalization methods, is really kind of, 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 of you perturb your system such that you open a gap and then you kind of see how the system kind of behaves when you close the gap. And um, the basic premise in all these tensor networks, and it's only very recently that actually this is really understood uh, whether, although it builds up on work of many, many people like, like Nishino, Jan McCulloch, uh, Luca Takiakozzo, uh, Frank Polman, many, many people have worked actually on, on, on indeed understanding this concept of entanglement scaling, but somehow I think there's only in, 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 the, in the last kind of years that we really got this kind of to work also for, uh, not just for matrix power states, but also for PEPs. And I would like to briefly kind of of, 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 of talk uh, uh, about uh, about this. So the whole the whole premise is that indeed, if you work with a finite bond dimension instead of somehow the infinite bond dimension or the exact wave function, what you do is not simulate the exact system that you are kind of the exact critical system that you are supposed to simulate, but you kind of have added a, no, a relevant perturbation to the system. Okay, so 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 and by increasing this bond dimension, you basically decrease this relevant perturbation, and you're interested in how this scaling works. 
And then some, uh, uh, some work of, of two years ago from uh, Bram van Ecke, uh, a student of mine. Uh, so we, we, we took this at, 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 at uh, um, well, he, he realized actually that, that, that this is a very important or a very powerful idea is that actually you can both so the typical simulations of critical systems we have done while well, you you kind of simulate for a certain set of parameters you you try to make your bond dimension as large as possible and then you take a different set of parameters for your magnetic field and do again try to extrapolate as a function of your bond dimension and then these extrapolated kind of results you will extrapolate them again a second time to at the end get somehow your scaling uh, analysis so what uh, Bram van Ecke actually realized is that this is not very kind of uh, uh, this is not 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 very efficient. You can actually do a double scaling at the same time. So so working with finite bond dimension and somehow changing your parameters in your Hamiltonian at the same time, all the data that you can have, all the data that you can get, you can actually use it for simulating this one critical point that you're interested. So you don't have to first extrapolate and then the extrapolated results extrapolate again. Now you can actually put all these results together and do one big extrapolation. And you get basically something like double collapses of your wavelengths. So for example, this is for a 2D POTS model. So it turns out, of course, all these tensor networks, they both work for stat mech models. Uh, and both and, and 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 for kind of quantum models like a stop neck model in 2D is very similar to a quantum model in 1D. So a critical system in 1D is, is basically a stop neck critical stop neck model in 2D and, and all these techniques kind of, 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 of work at the same time. But anyway, so by 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 carefully looking at these entanglement degrees of freedom and coming up with some scaling ansatz where you plot everything as a function of the correlation length, like, it turns out that you can get beautiful collapses uh, and, and therefore extrapolate your results in a much more precise way than. Uh, you could uh, do. So then we started thinking, okay, but what happens now if you want to simulate also like field theories? Okay, so so it's it's like that like critical spin systems. This is basically your UV physics, your UV scale is one, your IR scale goes to zero. Um, but um, gap spin system, of course, for which DMRG and all these things work basically exact, give you exact results. This is both when somehow you have UV scale and an IR scale with one zero. But what happens if you kind of want to simulate uh, quantum field theories is that uh, yeah, you have also UV scale to, 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 to worry about. And, uh, um, and, and, and so all these things together make it actually very non-trivial to, to try to understand how should I be, be able to, by, by making use of all this entanglement scaling, is it actually possible to simulate somehow a quantum field theory? So what does it mean in terms of these tensor networks, in terms of these bond dimensions to actually take the, the, the continuum limit of, uh, uh, of a field theory? And uh, this turned out to be a surprisingly hard problem that this turns out, I think, also very relevant relevant for quantum simulators, like the kind of things that, uh, that Roger was talking about. So how will you, if you say that with a quantum computer, you will simulate uh, a quantum field theory? Well, you must be sure actually that, that, that you will discretize it, you will put it on the lattice and so forth, but you want to be sure that there's no relevant kind of perturbations that you added, such that if you take the continuum limit, that you're actually simulating the theory that you want. And this is something that is very subtle and uh, um, and, and 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 actually uh, uh, not so easy to deal with. And uh, it turns out that with this sensor networks we have, well, using these scaling methods and so forth, we have been able, or certainly same person Bram van Eyck was able to uh, 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 to resolve this. And uh, so basically, we looked at lambda phi to the four, the the simplest, basically non-trivial. Uh, uh, um, a critical uh, quantum field theory, which for surprisingly, so this is basically, you would say, the easing model of the quantum field theory. So in, in, in 2D, like lambda phi to the four, even the critical point somehow of that model was only known up to a few years ago, up to let's say maybe two digits. So there's, there's not even known where the critical point was. And using somehow these, these scaling techniques, uh, we were able to kind of, 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 of extract these kind of things. So what is very interesting is actually, if you kind of start simulating such field theories is that, that there's, there's two contributions that, are, that, 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 that actually take care of that, that make sure that you need lots of entanglement to deal with this. So first of all, there's the UV scale, which is basically something like a central charge one contribution to the entanglement entropy. And then there's, in this particular case, this is in the Ising universality class, there's a, on top of that somehow the central charge one half contribution from somehow your IR physics at the critical point. If you wanted to see this, if you simulate somehow these models with tensor networks, you should see both contributions. So there's like whenever you V scale that goes to infinity, you need basically a critical theory um, uh, or a critical theory if you put it on the lattice. But additionally, then there's an extra level of criticality at the critical point of your CFT. And um, so we're able to do this and uh, well, using some scaling and then you have again something like a double collapse. So you have all these kind of different parameters. You have to collapse all these data on top of each other. And using this, we were able to kind of, of pinpoint basically where the critical point is of lambda phi to the four theory, which is 
basically for, to, to me this was a shock also that this was not known very precisely uh more precisely than this uh, uh but um, but this 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 is basically locates where is the critical point of this lambda five to the four uh, theory okay so uh so i'm uh um the next question is then of course what happens in 2d how you kind of how, how do you how do you how do you come up all these kind of things where either 2d classical or 1d quantum but now you want to also come up with a scaling hypothesis for uh for simulating these steps wafers for for simulating quantum critical points in 2 plus 1d um and uh, uh or 3d stop neck kind of problems and and at first sight this looks like a much harder problem because because uh, there are basically two relevant perturbations if you kind of look at how these methods work for simulating PEPs, you first have to approximate the eigenvector of the transfer matrix of your 2D transfer matrix. You have to kind of approximate this 1D kind of, 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 of system with a certain finite bond dimension. And of course, the PEPs itself has a finite bond dimension. So there's like two parameters, two bond dimensions that enter the, 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 the whole kind of, of, of picture. And it looks like this will be much, much harder. It will be much harder to actually come up with a scaling theory. So, but nevertheless, we came up with something like a, a very simple scaling hypothesis is that the bond dimension of your PEPs and the bond dimension of the MPS that you use to approximate the contraction of your PEPs, you can actually, it doesn't matter. The only thing that actually matters from these two parameters is the effective correlation length that is induced by these two parameters. And if you kind of simulate a system that is close enough to your critical point and the correlation length is the same for different D and chi, you are effectively looking at exactly the same model. And indeed, it turns out that this kind of scaling hypothesis uh, works extremely well and gives like a huge boost of actually being able then to uh, 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 to simulate these critical points because you will need much much less data than before for actually doing the scaling. Okay, so so now you don't have to first kind of extrapolate in chi and then in D. Now you can do these extrapolations all at the same time. So every data point that you do, even data points with very small D and chi, you can actually put in your kind of data collection and then do the finite size scaling. And somehow the, 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 the data collapses and, and actually extract your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, well, do, 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 do somehow the, the, the scaling limit to the, to, the, to, 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 the, to, the, uh, to the limit where your correlation like is infinity. So for example, this we did for uh, 3D dimers. So it's a stop map model of 3D dimers. That's uh, it's famous and, and all these collapses work extremely well. You can also do this for the 2D quantum Heisenberg model. And indeed somehow all these collapses, all these scaling hypothesis things work. And that means that actually now we are basically starting to be in shape for simulating quantum critical points in two plus one D. And indeed somehow these results that I show you here they basically prove that it is possible and it is possible actually without a cost that is too kind of large or too kind of extensive. Okay, so um, so if you would be very critical, you say, yeah, but quantum critical points, what we want to simulate is basically Fermi surfaces. Well, we also, turns out that actually even there, there is, it's also possible. So we, we, we looked at somehow several kind of, 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 of systems with, say, with, with, uh, with Fermi surfaces. Actually, we looked at, at cases for the moment that are just free fermions, but nevertheless, you can represent them with, with PEPS wave function with free fermions. And we look at basically what is the bond dimension scaling that you need to capture such that, such that you basically get the right physics, that you understand basically how to approximate somehow the ground state of some system with the Fermi surface using a PEPS. And it turns out that indeed also there, the scaling is very favorable. Okay, so, so you can actually approximate some whole the physics as a function of the bond dimension and then extrapolate somehow this bond dimension and you will get actually the physics of your uh, uh, system with Fermi surfaces, right? This was always a big critique that we got from uh, uh, from uh, condensed matter people that in tensor networks, well, you're not even, even able to do kind of Fermi surfaces. Well, it turns out that if you do scaling right, uh, uh, it is uh, it is actually possible uh, to, uh, to, to, to get this. And actually for some critical points, of course, it's harder than for others, but somehow the general kind of premise is that indeed somehow by doing the scaling, the entanglement scaling, right uh you we can approximate somehow systems with Fermi surfaces okay so let me summarize actually the 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 the, the, the first part of this talk so so there's i would say that actually the numerical development of peps algorithms as the, so these are basically the two-dimensional versions of dmrg as kind of originally kind of devised by stephen white these peps algorithms are basically do this for higher dimensions this is in full swing on this there's still fundamental like lots of fundamental truths or techniques or tricks to be found and to be discovered actually so uh, so the central challenge is to develop more efficient peps algorithms but uh, uh, and to put somehow this entanglement scaling that i just talked about actually to put it on, on, on a better kind of on, on a better sound or a sound theoretical basis uh, theoretical basis or a theoretical basis uh, but it seems somehow that these things work uh, very uh, very well and i'm very kind of 
uh, optimistic that somehow it's clear that the field is advancing, but much, much, much slower than we originally kind of anticipated. Okay, so let me kind of go to the second part of this talk, which is actually about the theoretical aspects, because I would say this is the really kind of nice thing. And the unique thing of these tensor networks is that they do not only provide somehow a very nice variational techniques or variational framework for, for dealing with systems that we don't really have other techniques for to simulate them. It also provides lots of, 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 of theoretical insight into the structure of these uh, wave functions. Okay, so, so, so and especially, so the theoretical aspects that are most fascinating that we have been working most on in the last years is actually to try to understand the symmetries and dualities, like, like how are symmetries of your physical system, uh, how do they affect somehow the, the entanglement degrees of freedom? How does the, somehow this shadow world, this lower dimensional world in which somehow everything is much cleaner and harmonic, how does that reflect actually somehow the, 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 the physics or the phases uh, of your full kind of uh, systems. And, uh, and uh, it turns out that actually by doing this, the, 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 there's lots of, these tensor networks seem to provide somehow the lattice versions of, of these topological field theories and also conformal field theories. There's lots of, of, of things that we are currently discovering and trying to uh, understand. Okay, so, uh, so for people that are interested in, in these theoretical ideas, uh, so together with Ignacio Sirac, David Perez Garcia, and Norbert Schuch, uh, last, uh, uh, last fall, uh, we kind of wrote a, a review paper that will be published soon uh, uh, um, in the Review of Modern Physics, uh, which is exactly about the theoretical aspects of, uh, of, 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 of matrix forward states and actually this projected entangled pair states. So, so, so basically, there's, there's, a, there's a whole kind of also introduction, there's the history, the, the, there's, there's basically connections with, with RG, how, what is, why is actually, what is the RG? And all these and all these kind of the, the, uh, and, 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 and this density matrix normalization group. Why why is there basically something like a notion of RG? Uh, how do you classify phases of matter in terms of symmetries? Uh, uh, what happens with fermions uh, and so further? And um, but the thing is that um, that that somehow that there's a very kind of nice. Uh, theoretical understanding of these whole tensor networks, and this is completely built on something that is called the fundamental theorem of matrix product states or the fundamental theorem of TEPS. And I would like to briefly kind of introduce this to you, such that somehow as a uh, as a way of of, of motivating somehow uh, or trying to, to 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 convey somehow the the, the 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 theoretical basis for for the fact that we can really understand uh, strongly correlated non-trivial strongly correlated phase of matter using somehow this tensor network uh, language. Okay, so so what is this? fundamental theorem of tensor networks is basically a way of relating two matrix product states to each other. So if I have one matrix product states, or as you will see, this is the same for a PEPS, and I have another kind of matrix product state, this means my global wave function is the same. Okay, so I have a global wave function that is represented by one type of tensor, and I have actually a different representation of that same tensor. Now, this is true if and only if these tensors A and B that represent somehow these matrix product states are related by some intertwiner X. Okay, so that there's some object X. So what this means is I have a tensor here with three legs, and if I multiply this leg with this matrix X, that is equal to basically multiplying the right leg of this tensor B with X. So basically what it tells you that if I come with this X and I pull it through this A, it transforms an A into a B. Okay, so this kind of direction is very easy. That if this is true, it's very easy to see that Psi of A has to be equal to Psi of B because this is some kind of just a basis change in your entanglement degrees of freedom, Hilbert space. And of course, the basis in which you work is completely irrelevant. Okay, but what is much, non, much more non-trivial is the other direction that actually global properties become somehow uh, uh, completely kind of, 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 of captured by, by, by making local claims. And this is the whole kind of idea. And this is a very powerful kind of idea that, uh, that, that, that deep the mathematical somehow of, of, of the mathematical framework for describing such equivalences is actually it turns out to be category theory. So, so that, that actually, if global wave functions are equal, what does that actually mean for the local descriptions of these wave functions? So the local tensors. So global wave functions are equal. Well, that doesn't mean that the local tensors are equal, but they have to be equal up to some equivalence relation. Yeah, it turns out that all these up to equivalence relations has some is, is, is part of, of, of a very of a huge kind of, of, uh, of field in mathematics that is called category theory, but was also discovered originally in the, in, in the, in the context of, uh, of, 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 uh, of quantum physics in, in, in terms of topological field theories. Okay, so, so and if we kind of restrict this, we say, like, look, I have kind of a global state that is invariant under global symmetry. So if I multiply every one of my physical spins with the same unitary, and that state has to be invariant. Well, this basically theorem tells you that if I have a U, so I act with the same U on all my spins, like, and I have an SU2 invariant state, 
then somehow the ground state wave function, the wave function describing this thing, must have a property that if I act with a UG here, there must be a matrix XG such that XG A UG is A times XG. So basically, what it tells you is that it's XG, that there must be some, some, uh, some reflection of somehow the symmetry operator on the virtual level. Uh, that, um, um, that, 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 that indeed sees that somehow that, 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 that takes care of the fact that your global wave function is symmetric. Now, the fantastic thing, and this was originally, I think, first really understood by uh, uh, Xi Chen and Xagan Wen and collaborators, um, is that somehow this X of G, so this representation of your physical symmetry on the virtual levels, does not have to be the same representation as the one on the physical level, but can actually be something that is called a projective representation. Okay, so it's, for example, on the physical level, you could have an SO3 symmetry, like for a spin one Heisenberg model, but on the virtual level, you could have an SU2 kind of group. And SU2, as you all know, is not equal to SO3. It has some kind of, they have topologically kind of distinct groups. There's no kind of way of, 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 of relating now that they even have a different number of, of, of elements. So, so what this SU2 is, it's basically a projective representation of your physical degrees of freedom. And, um, um, and, 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 and systems that are represented by different projective representations cannot be analytically or not kind of adiabatically be continued into systems that have kind of two different representations. And it turns out that all these different projective representations of a certain kind of symmetry group are, uh, are, are classified according to the second cohomology. Okay, so there's something like, and this understanding of, of this fundamental theorem um, uh, has actually allowed to, to completely kind of classify all these so-called SPT phases of matter in 1D. Okay, so, so basically the whole premise is that ground states of, 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 uh, of gapped quantum spin systems can be captured by matrix product states. So this is basically follows from the proof of Hastings and many other kind of proofs. And uh, uh, these matrix product states, if somehow they have a symmetry, must kind of transform or the entanglement degrees of freedom must transform according to some kind of representation. And if these representations are incompatible with each other, there is no kind of adiabatic way for kind of continuing for mapping one of these wave functions to another one without going to a phase transition. Okay, so, so this is something that is, uh, that is very easily understood by looking at somehow this, this shadow world, this virtual degrees of freedom, this entanglement degrees of freedom, how do they kind of transform according to your, uh, your, 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 well, how do they transform? What are the symmetries there? Turns out that actually the, the 2D version, the 2D, the PEPS version of this is much richer. And, uh, and this is basically the, the content of, 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 of most of the research that is being done in this, in this field of this theoretical research on, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on, on trying to classify phases using somehow these tensor networks. It turns out that, that this fundamental theorem, if I have a psi of A and a psi of B and they're equal to each other, it's not that there is just like an X that I can pull through that maps A to B. Turns out that we have to introduce a completely different object. And this is actually another tensor object that lives purely on the virtual world. So there is no, this is very, very similar actually to something like a Wilson loop, but it's a Wilson loop that acts purely somehow on the virtual degrees of freedom. And if you kind of take this matrix product operator, so everywhere you have a crossing here, you have to put a tensor. And if you kind of pull this tensor through your kind of, like, this is the A tensor, this is the B tensor, you will basically map one state to the other one. And this is in some sense, the equivalent fundamental theorem of PEPS, which has actually not been proven in full generality, but we believe that this should be the fundamental theorem. So I should have put quotes here around, uh, uh, around uh, this, this theorem. And it turns out that if you want to study, therefore, kind of, of topologically ordered systems like this SPT phase, but also truly topologically ordered systems in 2D, it turns out that this is uh, completely captured by studying somehow the representations induced by these matrix product operators. Okay, so, so it turns out that somehow topological order is witnessed by having non-trivial of these symmetries. So, so whenever you have a non-trivial topological phase of matter in 2D, it will go hand in hand with a non-trivial kind of symmetry that is represented by such a matrix product operator. Okay, and things like, like, uh, like having topological phases of matter that somehow there's no local order parameter. Well, it turns out that if you study this in this lower dimensional shadow world, that indeed you have topological order. Well, this will go hand in hand with symmetry breaking in this shadow world. Okay, so you basically recover this whole Landau symmetry breaking paradigm by studying the entanglement degrees of freedom of your system, okay, which is indeed one dimension lower. It's a lower dimensional kind of representation because this lives actually on interface. This is an effective one dimensional kind of system. It turns out that all symmetries, dualities, all these kind of things, this matrix product operator algebras are exactly the right language for dealing with, uh, with such things. Okay, so what are these matrix product operators? Okay, so these matrix product operators, they are basically 
just matrix product states, but instead of only having kind of legs on, on, on the bottom, you also have them on the top. So it's really an operator. It's like a density matrix, huh? a density ma to go. It's very similar to what Roger kind of talked about, how to map like have a wave function, how do you kind of go to density matrix as well? You just put both legs on top and on the bottom. I'm sorry. Uh, and this, this, this gives rise to matrix product operators. And, and basically you have an algebra of such matrix product operators. And it turns out that if this describes symmetries in your system to describe topological phases of matter, these kind of operators, they form a closed algebra okay, with structure factors N, A, B, C that actually do not depend on the system size. Okay, and this N, A, B, C are some data that uh, turn out to kind of completely describe fusion categories. Okay, so, so what these, these, these tensor network methods give you, like, like this equation, okay, this, this equation here, this pulling through equation, this basically tells you, well, this is my PEPS here. And if I have this red matrix product operator, I can basically pull this thing through. If there's no physical action, this turns out to be kind of general topological order. And then there's some consistency equations. If I have this for one of these red things, and I have this for another red thing, then it turns out that I should be able to fuse this. Indeed, the product of these two MPOs is actually the sum of kind of your, these MPOs. So they form a closed algebra. And this is reflected in this tensor network. So we have explicit kind of tensors. We can actually do all of this on a computer. We have explicit tensor. There's a new tensor needed, this red kind of dot here, that allows you to fuse two tensors. And then you have associativity somehow of this system because all of these things are, again, these are just matrices. So if you have deal with matrices with operators, things should be associative. Then there's another object that you have to introduce an F. And then somehow this F has to satisfy something that's called the Pentagon equation. So it turns out that actually these tensor networks, when you start describing topological phases of matter, and especially kind of symmetries in topological phases of matter, you automatically end up somehow with the representation theory of a fusion categories. And this apparently seems to be kind of new. Okay, So, so what happens is that these, these matrix product operator symmetries and, and, and actually the, the related kind of, 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 of wave functions that, that describe these PEPS wave functions, they are, they are labeled by some kind of a set of, 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 of tensors labeled by F0, F1, F2, F3, and F4. So there's like basically four, five different tensors. And it turns out that somehow the, the equations, the, the, the pulling through equations are in one-to-one -one correspondence with something that mathematicians have been studying for a long time ago already. And these are called bimodule, bimodule categories. Okay, so there's somehow they define the algebraic data of something that's called a bimodule category. And for people that are familiar with uh, conformal field theory, it turns out, as I will kind of show later, this is, this is well known somehow that these bimodule categories uh, are basically kind of allow you to classify somehow the rational CFTs. This was famous work of, 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 of Runkel, of Fuchs and Schweiger. Uh, and I will come back uh, to this if I have some, uh, some time. But anyway, so, so, so this, this whole PEPS formalism, so we didn't know any of this. It just comes out of this. These equations that we get turn out to be equivalent to this, but this is so a very natural kind of framework in which you kind of start studying the symmetries of these tensor networks. And if you choose, for example, all these F symbols equal to each other, you end up with something that's called these levin wentz string nets. You also have like quantum doubles. There's also kind of intertwiners that allow you to kind of understand how to map all these different kind of models to each other. Like you have like quantum doubles and, 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 and a related kind of rep model of, of, of levin wentz string type. Is there kind of a local quantum circuit that maps these models to each other? Well, it turns out that actually using these tensor networks, you can perfectly well do that and ex exactly show how to kind of construct such tensor networks or such kind of quantum circuits. Okay, so, so then of course, when you have topological phase of matter like these like when models, these thing that's, um, we know that that actually, if you put your kind of systems, these topologically ordered systems on on, 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 on surfaces with non-trivial genus, you get kind of interesting topological sectors. Okay, so, so, and what are these topological sectors? Well, it turns out that again, these are then a little bit more complicated kind of matrix for oper operator algebras that, uh, that are called actually Ocniano tube algebras. Okay? And uh, with this, you construct somehow all the possible ground states. Uh, all the possible topological sectors. And it turns out that these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the way you represent kind of onions in your system. Okay, so all these, of course, these topological ordered systems, all these Levin when string nets, but of course, much more system than that, uh, are, are so fascinating to condensed matter people because on how you get these fractional uh, excitations, you get these onions that are actually the elementary excitations. Well, it turns out that in this tensor network language now, you can construct these onions explicitly. And uh, um, so when you construct this explicitly using somehow these matrix product operators, you can understand topological spin by just you rotate these things and you get these fractional kind of topological spins, you get braiding, all of somehow these, 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 these things that actually I never really understood in this very abstract language of category theory become very tangible because you have actual tensors by which you can deal with this and you can actually construct these systems. 
Okay, so so like an application that uh, that, that that one of my students kind of, of had in mind, and it's uh, uh, Alexis Schotte and collaborators. Actually, we constructed them actually a completely novel type of quantum error correcting codes by exactly using somehow this whole formalism. So so this was a long kind of of of, of open question in the field of quantum uh, information: Is it possible to use somehow these exotic uh, um, um, uh, methods or these exotic systems, not if you have physically onions, but really as somehow just a spin one half system. I have qubits and I realize actually it's such a string that in terms of my qubits, can I use this for uh, uh, quantum error correcting codes? And you can actually do this. And the fantastic thing of these quantum error correcting codes that somehow you build using these string nets uh, and for which you actually needed this whole tensor network language is that these are universal. You don't have to kind of do this magic state distillation and you don't have to kind of go outside of your kind of code space to be universal quantum computation. So for kind of resolving problems like this, you really need somehow this full kind of, of, of tensor network language to actually simulate this and actually prove that there is indeed thresholds using such kind of uh, well, such error correcting codes. But uh, let me kind of, the last minutes, Try to kind of 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 show you what what direction we are we are going to or what somehow I find very exciting in this in this in this very tangible way of understanding uh, uh, tensor networks. So it turns out that that actually these 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 string nets or these these eleven when models um, 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 they they are well known to be to 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 be related to topological field theory. Okay? These are basically they are very strongly related to the to the zero state sets and 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 there's like a whole framework of course that, that that started in quantum field theory that that relates all somehow these things to each other so there's topological field theory then turns out that that that, that people like Moore and Zyberg understood that actually the, the right that, that somehow the, the right language of, of of connecting topological field theory to conformal field theory is actually model modular tensor categories and there's there's lots of kind of beautiful works that that relate these things to each other also Witten, of course had had understood very well that if you have a topological field theory that actually if you look at the border the 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 the, the, the border of these systems you get effective like cfts so somehow from the mathematical point of view it's very clear that somehow all these things basically are described by the same uh, uh, mathematics okay so this is all kind of in the continuum so what these Tensor networks, and especially also, of course, the work of Kitayev and Levin and Wendu is, is actually look at these topological phases of matter. This is by putting these things on the lattice. So that's the question what survives of these topological field theories if you put them on the lattice? And these are these quantum doubles, thing that's and so further. And of course, there's also like the, 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 the conformal field theory side, somehow the lower dimensional side of this case, in, in which you basically describe critical and anionic spin chains. And this this dates back to kind of, of, of old work of Pasquier and, 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 and actually has recently kind of, of, of there were beautiful papers of, of, uh, uh, of Dave Aysen and Paul Fendley and collaborators where they, they basically try to kind of, of, of see that indeed somehow critical spin systems are very, very strongly related to these tensor uh, categories. It turns out that using this, uh, these tensor networks, there's a very easy way of mapping, basically, of a direct way of mapping these string net models to these critical spin systems. So these string net models are two plus one D kind of systems that are topological order. So there's not really there's a big gap. There's nothing really kind of 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 of, of, of there's no kind of correlation length in the system besides having interesting onions. What you have here is actually a 1D quantum critical point with kind of power law of correlations, and it's or a 2D classical stop MEC model that has power law decay of correlation. And it's not entirely clear how you would map these things to each other. Well, it turns out that there's a formalism that is called strange correlators that does that immediately for you. And uh, uh, this is basically implementing something that. Uh, that Fuchs, Runkel, and Schweigert kind of, of had a whole series of very famous papers around 2000, kind of formalizing, really from the mathematical physics point of view, this, this connection between tensor categories and conformal field theory. What this actually does, these tensor networks, I mean, this is actually in collaboration with them, is, 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 is implementing this map on the lattice such that you can actually still kind of do these things numerically. Okay. And uh, so indeed, somehow what Fuchs, Rückel, and Schweigert kind of, 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 of discovered in this series of papers is that, that actually modular uh, or module categories, somehow the model categories that, in, that, that, that basically popped up when you were describing symmetries of pepsis or the right language. So I don't really have time to go to it in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in detail, but it turns out that somehow this, they, they, they use these bimodules to describe CFTs. Okay? So, so they, they, they basically said that, that you need kind of, 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 of different kind of categories and you need some modules and, and using all this, by combining all this, you can basically describe all possible kind of ways in which all possible topological features of CFTs. Well, what happens now uh, is that it turns out that, that, that this mapping from topologically ordered states to, uh, uh, to critical wave functions or critical systems 
And, and, and so this is like 2 plus 1D quantum, this is 2D classical, can very easily be done by just kind of projecting this wave function. This is a wave function on a, on a large Hilbert space. What you do is basically just project all your physical degrees of freedom on some product states. Okay, so, so this gives you then a partition function of a classical stat MAC model. Okay, because you start with a wave function in 2 plus 1D, but basically get rid of somehow your physical Hilbert space. You project all this physical degrees of freedom on some non-trivial product state. It's just product states everywhere you project this on. And what this is then is the partition function of somehow a classical stat MAC model. Okay, and turns out that actually all these string nets are one to you can like all the all the famous integrable kind of, of spin systems stop mech models in 2D can be kind of obtained by indeed starting from such a string net and 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 and, and devising or kind of choosing this strange correlator in a fiducial kind of a, in, in a good way. So like this Ising models, hard hexagon models, RSOS models, LRF models, all these models that, that people like Baxter kind of solved exactly and, and for which somehow that formed the basis for, for understanding critical criticality and in, 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 in 2D classical stuff. Like, turns out that somehow this is a one to one relationship between these, these string nets. And of course, what happens if you project these things is that, of course, these symmetries, these matrix product operator symmetries, they completely survive. It's not because somehow you projected the physical degrees of freedom that somehow these end matrix product operator symmetries disappeared. And these are exactly all these dualities that, that, that people talked about, people like. Uh, like Kadanov had fantastic papers or in the beginning of the 70s, like Kadanov and Seva, in which they kind of talk about disorder operators and dualities and all these kind of things. Well, it turns out that these matrix product operators, if you interpret them now from the point of view of somehow this stuff MEC model that is critical, is somehow the one that is responsible for the fact that it's critical. So what happens in your critical system is that you have kind of enlarged symmetries. Namely, suddenly you get these matrix product operator symmetries that are only there in the critical point. Okay, and, and, and it turns out that indeed it's kind of understanding symmetries of these tensor networks is the key in unraveling somehow the, 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 the full somehow topological content of your conformal field theory. Okay, so, uh, so in a very recent paper with my student, uh, Robin van Hove and uh, collaborators, actually, we, 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 we did this, let's say, for the critical three state possible. It turns out that this is actually a very com complicated to do it right. Okay, it turns out that, that the POTS model itself is actually not a modeler, somehow the, the, the fusion rules of the POTS model are not, does not give rise to modeler categories. So this is actually the right module. You have to kind of find other kind of categories to connect them to, to construct all the possible topological sectors. It turns out that there's like many, many different topological sectors. Uh, you, uh, you have eight types of defect lines, many more tubes. Somehow all of these kind of things can now be done explicitly. And as far as I understood, this had never kind of been able, nobody had really done that because the POTS model, if you kind of naively write it down, you would not write it down. You would write it down a representation that lacks basically all these different kind of, of types of symmetries. And you have to do this to basically extract all somehow the top for the possible spectra out of this. But my time is really running out. So, you can, so now basically for all possible topological sectors of the POTS model, you can get somehow your towers and understand somehow the full kind of content. Can also kind of do things on the cylinder, uh, um, understand somehow how boundary kind of conformal fields, the, 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 somehow the different boundaries are mapped to each other by kind of implementing or multiplying this with these matrix product operators and so further. So, uh, but I'm really running over time. So let me kind of just conclude uh, that, um, that, so I wanted to give you an overview of basically the research that's being done in this field of tensor networks. So there's both a very kind of strong numerical component, but also like, I think, a very interesting theoretical component. And this is somehow the magic. And I think the really kind of unique thing of these types of networks is that these things go at the end, hand in hand. At the end, kind of these matrix product operators, you actually need them if you want to simulate somehow your kind of POTS model in the right sectors and understand somehow all the different kind of boundary conditions that these things have and actually to construct these boundary conditions. So, uh, um, um, of course, there's lots of challenges left. Okay, So we want faster, more robust types of methods. We want to extend this, of course, not just this, this matrix product operator symmetries to two dimensions. We want to actually do this in three dimensions. These would become kind of membrane symmetries. We want to kind of completely develop this whole theory. There is still kind of an issue with chiral topological order that we do not completely kind of capture. And of course, this is actually related by the fact that if you have chiral topological order, that this is actually kind of coming from a higher dimensional kind of system, like a 3D system. Uh, we would like to simulate lattice gauge theories, understand all the Wilson loops, all the somehow the defect lines, and so further. So, uh, uh, but anyway, I uh, let me kind of end with this picture that took me uh, 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 more time to make than actually the whole talk. Uh, and thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Frank, for such an interesting talk. Uh, it's open now to questions. Please, do you have questions? <laughs>
Um, yes. So I have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. So Frank, very nice talk, uh, beautiful summary. Uh, just to get a feel for the matrix product operator set. Suppose I give you AKLT wave function, the AKLT model ground state wave function. It's a very beautiful, simple matrix product state. It can be written as a matrix product state. Can you motivate your matrix product operator from starting from that state? Because that state has just one matrix. And it's so, so, so the AKLT model and this, this A's are basically the poly matrices. Mm. And this U of G would basically be, well, you could say this, what is the symmetry? It's like the spin one representation of S2, which is actually SO3. Okay, so basically you have an SO3 symmetry. But of course, these poly matrices, they transform projectively according to this X of G. So what happens actually, if you, if you look somehow, what, what you get here is, is, is a spin one half representation on the virtual level. What happens if you multiply somehow the spin one half representations of uh, that, that, that that correspond, which is a projective representation of this of, of, of your physical SO3 symmetry? So it turns, it turns out that this does not form a representation of SO3. It only forms a representation of SO3 up to a sign, up to a plus minus sign. Okay, and this is the whole point: is that this this minus sign is something. It's either plus or minus one, and 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 it cannot be anything else. And therefore. Whenever you have something like an index that is labeled by an integer, it must be a topological index. Okay? And uh, so the fact that this transform according to half kind of integer representations, while your physical degrees of freedom tra transform according to integer representations, actually shows you that, that, that there is something topological going on there. Because if you want to transform this model to something that for which this would also transform to an integer representation, this index would disappear. This plus or minus sign would basically become always plus one. There would always be a gauge in which somehow it disappears. And therefore, there is no kind of continuous way in which you can suddenly kind of go from a one to something like a one and a minus one. And, um, and, and, and of course, like this is an SPT phase. This is only true as long as you basically have a matrix product state that's protected. If you kind of say like, I'm only interested in the Hilbert space of wave functions with a certain global symmetry. Whenever you kind of are allowed to break that symmetry, then it turns out that all kind of in the bosonic case, all matrix product states are connected to each other. This is actually not true if you kind of introduce fermions. In the case of fermions, even if you don't have any physical symmetries, it turns out that there's actually two different types of matrix product states. I did not talk about this at all. There's something that's called graded tensor networks by which you can actually see that there's indeed two kind of completely different types of graded tensor networks. And of course, this corresponds to the Majorana case the Kitayev chain and somehow the normal kind of case for fermions. Uh, but, uh, but this is in the, in the 1D case. Of course, these matrix product operators are exactly the two dimensional version of that. Okay, so they are exactly somehow, they are somehow, what you have in two dimensions is that this would be this X, but it has an extra kind of index also in the other direction. So it has actually these, these things are connected to each other. And, uh, and, and, and for systems that have non-trivial topological order, it's very important that actually these, uh, these extra degrees of freedom, these fluctuating degrees of freedom are there for kind of capturing the, the symmetries in your system. So for example, like, like as I explained that at, at some point you will map this to something like a CFT or, 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 or a, stop, a critical stop MAC model. Well, then somehow these things uh, could, for example, mimic the the the, the Kramers one year duality. Okay, so this would be something like that. It would be like this matrix product operator would effectively implement something like a Kramers one year duality, which is very very similar actually to a Jordan Winger transformation. So it, it's like so these are non-local operations that somehow non-local symmetries that emerge in these uh, in these systems. Thank you. Fascinating. Uh, Shashua? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So you mentioned before that PEPs could be used to describe certain Fermi surfaces. So can yeah. you also use PEPs to describe, say, a system with a Fermi arc? Or for say, example, a pseudo gap phase? So wait, are you, uh, what is a Fermi arc? I'm actually not familiar with this. So this is like, of course, the Dirac point is, 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 is easy, but it's, what is a Fermi? So it would be like an incomplete Fermi surface. So some of it is, is like a disconnected Fermi surface. It might be seen like the pseudo gap phase of certain uh, superconductors. Yes, well, this, this is indeed problematic. If you want to use a unit cell, if you want to use a PEPS with actually one that has a very small unit cell. So, so you would need actually to, to break your transition variance and start working with bigger unit cells such that you basically have some fractional filling of these surfaces. Um, um, so, so certainly for, 
for simulations that perhaps with in a thermodynamic limit, indeed, this is this is problematic if you kind of are in incommensurate kind of fillings. But if as long as you fill with some kind of, of fractions, uh, that should be possible, but you will have to use kind of big unit cells in your capsules. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, further questions? Manu Kumar? Yeah, thank you. Uh, nice talk, Frank. So I have a one question. What is the status of uh, temperature dependence and also the dynamical uh, calculation in the PEPs? Yeah. So, so um, that's, a, that's a very good question. So what happens at finite temperature actually is that, um, um, that typically these, these, the ground states are the hardest. Okay? So at finite temperature, it's actually easier to, 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 to write down tensor networks. And um, there has indeed been quite some progress there in, in, in relating cluster expansions to this kind of tensor network language. I don't have any slides about this, but it turns out that actually all this, these ideas of cluster expansions can be adopted to the framework of tensor networks to construct very efficient kind of ways of, uh, of writing down thermal states of uh, strongly correlated systems, both in one and two, and then actually also even in 3D. Um, the dynamics, on the other hand, is of course something that is uh, much more problematic. So, so working basically in, in, in the real time and doing something like a quench, uh, what happens is that, that the, the amount of entanglements kind of starts growing like like uh, like extensively and, and you would need exponentially large bond dimensions for uh, capturing somehow the physics uh, using somehow these tensor networks now this is not necessarily a problem because we know that, that 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 basically what happens while somehow this entanglement grows so much is that that these these correlations have become basically completely invisible because because somehow they they become somehow uh, they, they, they become embedded in the really the multi-partite correlations of your system. And as long as you look at kind of few body correlations, you would never basically be able to distinguish the fact that this is very highly entangled or it is thermal. And it's one of the big frustrations for anybody working in this field of tensor networks that nobody has really come up with a way of converting indeed this real-time evolution into an evolution that actually kind of maps pure states to mixed states. Okay, because this is physically what is going on now. If you have like a system that is that, that creates kind of extensive amounts of entanglement, okay, so, so that it get volume loss, effectively what happens is that you can describe this whole system with a thermal state, with somehow a finite, with a state that has a finite entropy density. And these states can, of course, very well be represented using matrix product operators, just because I said they are just like Gibbs states. And, uh, but nobody has been able to go up with, 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 with an algorithm that, that we would say, yes, this is actually kind of showing that how this thermalization happens. And so it could actually be that, that before you thermalize, you go, you have to go to kind of very, very highly entangled states. And then before you can actually kind of describe your systems with uh, the thermal states, there are actually very nice works of, 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 of people like Dubai, where they have some field theoretic kind of arguments why this would be like that. But, but it's still, this is certainly one of the, uh, one of the, uh, the big frustrations of people in the field of tensor networks is that we don't, we still don't understand how to, how to kind of, of simulate this and how to kind of turn entanglement into entropy. Okay, thank you very much. So further questions? I have some questions, Frank. I have several questions, but like, I will ask you, you know, uh, perhaps the most challenging one. So going back to dualities, you know, many of the things that you were talking about, one can obtain by using the technique of bone algebras, okay? So you don't need to go, I mean, you work directly with the model, with the Hamiltonian or with a partition function. I mean, if you have a classical system and you apply the bone algebra techniques, uh, which smells similar to what you are doing, but you are doing at a different level. You are doing at the level of uh, the tensors. Okay, so my, and, and, and not at the level of the algebra of interactions, although, you know, some of the interaction is encoded in the tensor, but, you know, the interactions may involve, you know, longer range things, for example. So my question is, uh, what kind of advantage I can get by using this approach uh, uh, that I cannot get by using the Bon algebra technique? Okay, and in particular, the reason why I'm saying is that it could be, I could imagine some cases, this is what I could imagine. Suppose I have a model that is very complex and I don't know how to really solve that model. But I have some very good, I suspect that there is a very good tensor network representation of that model. It may happen that indeed using your techniques, I can derive 
some dualities using your technique on your tensors, I can derive some dualities to some other model that, you know, by using the usual bone algebra, it's hard to see because I'm using the bone algebra of the real model, okay? But by using the tensor network, uh, that is, you assume it's a very good approximation, you may be going to another model that indeed is, you know, not very far because it's in the low energy sector in some way of your theory. So that kind of advantage I can see, but is there any other advantage of your way of doing things with respect to the bonus? Right? Because to me, it smells very similar. Well, like, like, like certainly for this example of the POTS model that I showed you here. Um, no, that's a very good example. With the bone algebra, you do it in two seconds. No, 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 but you don't get all these defect lines. I don't think you get somehow oh, these yeah, different, Absolutely. Uh, you yeah, you yeah. don't know how to construct the, somehow the eight types of defect lines using well, the bone algebra. Well, because you, okay. get, you, you get actually, you really need somehow these this different kind of, 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 of labels from this uh, category because, because actually the, the POTS model themselves is not a model category. So it turns out that, that actually to get all your symmetries, as far as I understood, you really need to kind of do it in this language to understand basically all the symmetries of the POTS model. Yeah, no, I mean, you can do, you can do with the bon Azura. What I don't know because I didn't think about is this eight type of defect lines. That's a point well taken. I would like to understand that's the reason why I'm asking you the question. What do I gain? Okay, because for example, what the bone algebra doesn't give you directly is, for example, the string operator. Suppose you have something that has topological order in some, in some representation, and now I want to know what is the string order or the brain order, okay, in the dual representation that has topological order. Right. So the bone algebra, if you know some lambda order in some phase, then through the bone algebra, you can get the string or the brain order. But my question is, is it possible that even if you do not know with your technique, you do not know the lambda order in some representation, uh, you can get the string order by using your technique? Because that is a difference. Because if you can get all the string orders, I mean, I mean, I mean, I have a challenge for you. If what if the answer to my question is yes, you can, then I will ask you, okay, what is the order parameter of QCD? So take a young miss theory and now tell me what is the order parameter of QCD? So what is your answer? I mean, so can you get a string and brain orders from these tensor network techniques? Well, yes. So that's exactly the kind of questions that we want to ask. Okay. So for QCD, I don't know. I don't know enough about QCD, and and, and of course, people. I don't think that the, the answer is known. So, so first the disclaimer. I'm not claiming here that, of course, that we are discovering new kind of critical models. Okay. So people in the CFT community, they all know somehow that this has completely been understood somehow this whole language. So this is exactly somehow the work of of. of of, of, of Schweigert and, and Fuchs and, and, and Fuchs and Rucker and Schweigert, they have basically done that on the, on, on the, they have classified all these CFTs. They have understood how to kind of what, what the defect lines are in these kind of things. What was not understood, as far as I understand, is how much of this survives on the lattice. Okay, so how do you actually start doing this um, in, in a tangible way on the lattice? Even if I give you a model somehow, how can you understand all these topological defects? Okay, so, so our motivation was to, to, to understand all of this, to understand all the dualities. Okay, so, so, so there is this amazing net of dualities. Now, if you kind of look at StatMec models, there is this kind of notion of you have the six vertex models, you have the RSOS models, you have all these kind of different ways of describing the same CFTs, okay, the same critical theories, but with completely different degrees of freedom. And we wanted to understand this from the point of view of these tensor networks. Now, it turns out that all these different dualities correspond to intertwiners that you kind of relate to this fundamental theorem of PEPs, no? that you can start, you can construct actually these matrix product operators that map one model to the other model. You can map, map, map models that actually somehow, in one case you have a quantum group symmetry, in the other case you have some of these category symmetries, and we understand now how to kind of do this. So our motivation was to understand this extremely kind of well-known literature from the point of view of these tensor networks. And of course, the goal is to use them then into kind of non-trivial numerics. Like you say, at the end, this is, this is kind of not just related to CFTs. We can actually also do this for models that are not integrable for things for which people have no kind of uh, uh, exact understanding. 
Okay. Also, all these techniques, we would like to understand what happens in higher dimensions. No? So there's a priori no reason why somehow these matrix product operator symmetries cannot be generalized to somehow papal symmetries. So this is where we are kind of working towards. So, so of course, I'm not, we, we are just rediscovering things that many, many people have already discovered for a long time ago. Like your, I forgot how you called it, the bond, the bond order, no, the bond order technique, no, the... Uh, so bond algebra technique. The you know, bond algebra technique. I've, I actually don't know what this is, but, but it, it probably has kind of, it, it, it might be very, very similar to this. I, I, this is well possible, although, um, although certainly for this POTS model that I just talked about, we have kind of, or my students have done an extensive literature search, and we have never seen anything like that. We have never kind of, we have never found any kind of place where for the POTS model, you actually kind of can construct all these defect lines and all possible topological kind of, 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 of sectors of these models. Um, um, but I would be very interested, of course, to, to, to discuss further with you. We should do this probably offline, but... Uh, yeah, um, yeah, sure. No, sure. I have several questions, but they are very technical questions. So I prefer to... Uh, uh, I prefer that other people ask questions and we can continue offline. So is there any other question? No? Well, if there are no more questions, Thanks a lot, Frank. I mean, excellent talk. I always enjoy talking to you. Uh, and uh, with these, I mean, we close this session. So uh, we expect that you can join us next week uh, with a quantum information, quantum uh, computation session. Okay, guys. So have a nice week. So and um, Frank, uh, we, can, we can chat off the line, I think. Yes, yes, let's do that. Um, today or, or, or another day? We can chat another day. Don't worry. Yeah. Go and relax. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. See you thank soon. You. See you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thank you. Bye bye.